spoilers. <laughs> uh, hello and welcome to the stream. Uh, my name is Dr. Rachel Chapman. This is the weekly machine learning and NLP coffee chat where every week we talk about stuff that happened um, that's relevant for folks working in uh, language technology and machine learning generally. Uh, I'm Dr. Rachel Tatman. I don't remember if I said that or not. And uh, my channel uh, slash stream slash podcast, if you're listening to this via uh, podcatcher, is for anyone who cares about language technology and other people. So as usual, we will start by talking about different research. Uh, Coaling happened since last Thursday, which is, uh, it's, it's interesting because I don't believe it's an ACL conference, but the papers are in the ACL anthology. Um, so uh, big, big research conference. I say big, a research conference. Uh, so we've got some coaling papers. Uh, and they'll talk about, you know, general practical professional stuff, news that's related to, uh, you know, language technologists work. Hello, Elton, welcome. Uh, and Opsuna, welcome to the stream. Uh, and they'll talk about politics. We only have a couple things, uh, mostly not from the U.S. this week. Um, and then sort of news uh, stories related to, to ethics generally and applications. Uh, hello, Duming. Welcome to the stream. Uh, and then finally, uh, we've got some some just like fun stuff to talk about uh, that I think will, uh, one of which is uh, hyper-regional pizzas, uh, which I think is a great example of very rare lexical items. Uh, so with that, let's hop right in to talking about our research. Our research. I've done none of this research. <laughs> this is research done by other people. Uh, first up, we have uh, this paper that it looks like was actually submitted earlier this month, but this is the first time I sort of ran across it. Uh, and it is a preprint. Uh, the title of which is A Human Rights-Based Approach to Responsible AI, uh, and the authors are, I'm probably going to say some of these names wrong, so I'm going to apologize in advance for that, um, Vin Vinod Kumar? Vinod Kumar? Vinod Kumar? Uh, Prabhakaran? Again, apologies. Um, not familiar with the correct pronunciation of that word. Uh, Margaret Mitchell, Timnit Gebru, both of who were uh, previously at Google. Uh, Margaret's now at um, Hugging Face, and Timnit is at Dare, D-A-I-R. Uh, and Yeson Gabriel, I-A-S-O-N. So those are the four authors. Uh, and uh, I thought that it was a particularly interesting paper. All right, so it looks like Vanad Kumar is still at Google Research and Yeson? If I had to guess, this looks like the Greek form of the name Jason, uh, but I could be wrong about that. So it could also just be said Jason. Um, if anyone knows, please feel free to pop that in the chat. Is it DeepMind? Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just going to read the abstract and then sort of skim and we can talk about the main points. But research on fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics of AI-based interventions, uh, sometimes called FATE, sometimes called F-A-C-C-T, um, just different abbreviations for the, the field. Uh, AI-based interventions in society have gained much needed momentum in recent years. However, it lacks explicit alignment with a set of normative values and principles that guide this research and interventions. That guide this principles that guide this research and interventions. Something's weird about the um, pluralization agreement there. Uh, Jerome says, <laughs> not sure that uh, ex-Googler badge is worth mentioning for both of them. Yes, they were uh, both very, um, very famously fired for pushing back on uh, different projects on ethical grounds. Hey, look, it's been a minute. Hello, welcome to the stream. Uh, rather, an implicit consensus is often assumed to hold for the values we impart into our models, something that it is odds with the pluralistic world we live in. In this paper, we put forth the doctrine of universal human rights as a set of globally salient, salient and cross-culturally recognized set of values that serve as a grounding framework for explicit value alignment in responsible AI 
and discuss its efficacy as a framework for civil society partnership and participation. Um, so basically what they're saying is like, hey, you know, if someone is trying to build a system that's not doing things that are you know, blatantly unethical, what ethical framework do you use? A lot of people assume that their sort of uh, whatever ethical framework that they are using is going to apply universally, but that is not the case. Um, so can we use something that there is sort of international agreement on specifically protected human rights uh, as a way to figure out what is good, question mark, in this uh, situation. We argue that a human rights framework orients the research in this space from the machines and the risk of their biases, sorry, away from the machines and the risks of their biases and towards humans and the risks to their rights, essentially helping to center the conversation around who is harmed, what harms they face, and how these harms may be mitigated. Um, and I would say that this is kind of parallel to, um, certainly in the US, the way we think about uh, research ethics. Um, so in particular, the the sort of the centering of participants in and donors in the research ethics space, um, where like, sure, maybe, you know, the the drug that you're testing in this, tri in this trial may cure cancer, um, but also it may not. And, you know, depending on the side effects or, you know, the, the effects on the people who are taking it to see if it works or not, um, you know, you have to consider the well-being of the people who are involved in the study, uh, as well as sort of like the hypothetical well-being of um, other people. So it's just sort of the general gist there. Um, Yes, so uh, the it's a position paper. I'll pop the link in the chat for, for y'all here. Uh, it's a position paper and they're basically saying we can use human rights as a way to um, talk about this, if that makes sense. Um, da -da -da -da, uh, and I am interested if they talk about the sort of the UN conceptualization of human rights in here. Yep. Okay. So talk about the second world war and how this human rights framework, yep. Uh, was developed in response to the Holocaust. Um, Da, 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 culminating in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations General Assembly in 1948. Um, yeah, so that is the sort of the framework that they are using, which is, you know, the, univers the Universal Nations, the uni United Nations. Uh, I'm also reading this word universal, which is not making it easier, um, is, of course, you know, a governing body with representatives from many different countries. So in theory, um, things that the UN can agree with are representative of shared values across those countries, ideally. Um, anyway, so they're sort of saying like, hey, uh, this is what we can use to judge, you know, whether or not a system is harmful. Is it violating human rights? Um, which I personally think is great. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's a really helpful, helpful framework. So, um, uh, and then there's uh, a, a big discussion, right? It's a 17 page paper um, and they're sort of sending out their um, their different points. And let's talk about uh, one of their case studies here. So this is an illustration, section 3.1, the human right to freedom from discrimination. Uh, I'm reading now. Uh, the right to be free from discrimination is a negative right not to be harmed in certain ways. Uh, so a negative right is you have the right for this not to be done to you. A positive right is you have a right to have this, right? So um, the right to life is a positive right. You have a right to live. Uh, the right to freedom from discrimination is a negative right because you have the right not to be discriminated against. Uh, Jerome says, internationally agreed human rights should we target first making AI obey to make AI obey laws. Um, I'm assuming here you're meaning, you know, legislation passed by specific countries and not like Asimov's laws. Um, and I would say that um, our legal framework is certainly lagging uh, the pace of technical, certainly in the US, uh, of technical innovation. And also if we, you know, start with a legal framework, um, plenty of things were legal that are not ethical um, and plenty of things that are ethical are, you know, either explicitly illegal or, you know, depending on your framework, of course, um, are either explicitly illegal or um, not required <laughs> by law, right? So uh, if you are talking specifically about ethics, I, the law can be a helpful partner, uh, but I don't think it should be the main 
the main tool used specifically in a research um, and sort of exploratory uh, R&D um, context, right? Uh, and also, like, we'll talk about some laws today that, you know, uh, directly limit human rights, right? So are, um, if you're talking about, say, the right to freedom from discrimination, some laws straight up discriminate, right? Particularly, um, I think there's a, a law in Turkey recently that was passed that we'll talk about. Uh, so yes, I think that a legal framework can be a tool. Uh, I do not think that it is uh, the primary tool that we should be using as researchers and practitioners, um, particularly at the pace that the field's moving right now. Uh, it is heavily impacted by prevalent forms of algorithmic bias. Uh, I'm reading again. The right to be free from discrimination is also often the right that is most directly relevant to the majority of work in the fake community. Um, and I would say this is, you know, good and important. For me, I am much more worried about other direct harms than discrimination, but I think discrimination is an important thing to consider. Uh, reading Oh no! I clicked a link. Um, the right to be free from discrimination is also often the right most, uh, we've talked about that, an algorithm system, algorithmic system that treats individuals differently based on an attribute such as race or gender with negative consequences for group members and without due cause is in and of itself a violation of the right, right to be free of discrimination. However, certain instances of discrimination that result in withholding other rights have a compounding effect. For example, an algorithmic content moderation system that disproportionately uh, censors individuals speaking a certain dialect not only risks interfering with their right to freedom of expression, but also potentially impedes their right to be free from dis uh, discrimination in exercising that right. Um, and they talk about the sort of the early studies uh, around U.S. law enforcement. Uh, I believe this is the the compass, perhaps. Let's see. What's this citation? Uh, algorithmic realism, expanding the boundaries of algorithmic thought uh, from the uh, 2020 FAT conference. So that's, um, or FACT, F-A-T or F-A-C-C-T uh, conference. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Back up, back up. Uh, one side effect is that the scope of this conversation has also been largely limited to discrimination in the U.S. context, which I agree is an issue, uh, compared to the more global human rights framework. For instance, while the right to be free from discrimination based on religion or language has equal standing within the global human rights framework, these axes of discrimination are rarely dealt with within the freight research community compared to discrimination based on race or gender, which are prominent concerns in the U.S. American public discourse. Um, although I will say that religious discrimination and linguistic discrimination are also very much prevalent in the United States. Uh, Jerome says, ethics includes a part of subjectivity, and this blurs the target of the work. I mean, uh, if you think that ethics is subjective, but the law is not, um, then we have clearly not been reading <laughs> uh, or, or talking to the same people. Um, I would say that they are both subjective, right? Um, which is why we have courts. Hey, old player, good to see you. Um, and I think that, you know, the risk there, right? So the risk of being like, well, ethics suggests is sub suggestive, um, subjective, uh, and, you know, we can't all universally agree what's good or bad, right? Um, uh, just an example, if there's someone who really enjoys just like kicking strangers, they're going to say, I derive a lot of enjoyment from just kicking strangers, so I should be able to do it. Um, but the people that they're kicking are probably going to be like, actually, it hurts and I don't like it and you shouldn't do it, right? Um, so I don't know where I was going with that. Anyway, um, I think the fact that there is subjectivity and that it is difficult to, um, you know, determine shared ethical frameworks doesn't mean it's not worth doing. And in fact, I think it is more worth doing before the systems are built and deployed than it is sort of in a post hoc way, which is where a lot of the sort of anti-discrimination research um, comes up. So um, yeah. Uh, this gap in terms of understanding the full range of characteristics that may serve as axes of unjust discrimination, which will always be contextual to a specific society, uh, can be addressed in part through reflection on the more expansive categorization uh, invoked by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, 
so and that's so to, to talk to Jerome's point about a legal framework uh, I'm reading again furthermore indexing fate research on the legal framework of a particular country carries with it additional risks when viewed from a global standpoint for example a single country's legal framework may not give all groups adequate protection against discrimination an issue that looms particularly large in the context of unjust laws or natural practices um, so a great um, example from the US context right now is that there's um, I would say a nationwide push to uh, legalize discrimination against trans people. Um, again, like legal, yes, the laws have been passed, many of them, um, especially targeting trans children, but that does not uh, make them ethical, right? Um, and certainly doesn't fit them within this, uh, this framework of freedom from discrimination. To guard against these pitfalls, a more universal set of principles, such as the universal human rights doctrine, may serve as a re useful reference point, and this means, and as a means, of checking national laws. Let me read the sentence again. As means of checking national laws, this kind of gaps or denial of equal rights to citizens. Okay, I think there's probably an error in that sentence, but I cannot recover it uh, sufficiently. <laughs> Cognition says, but what if I really, really like kicking strangers like a lot? Uh, well, I would say that your uh, right to do enjoyable activities ends when it uh, impinges on other people's rights. In this case, not to be kicked. You, you are free to create, you know, the VR stranger kicking simulator if that is your, uh, your delight, but uh, not if it is harming other people. And I would say that's a generally universally accepted uh, sort of ethical stance. Anyway, so if you're interested in the paper, uh, it is on archive. Uh, speaking of discrimination, uh, so this next paper is from Koling, uh, which is a biannual which is the one that happens every two years, Conference on Human Language Technology, um, was founded not in conjunction with the ACL, but is now included in the ACL anthology. Um, I don't think it's run by the ACL either. I think they're just sort of like the papers are folded in. Yeah. Uh, Jerome says, uh, should I create an AI model recommending the death penalty for convicted people in countries where the death penalty is accepted? Uh, well, if you're using your human rights framework, uh, clearly not, because that would infringe on those people's rights to life, which is one of the universal human rights. So again, if you're using this framework, the answer is clearly no. Uh, yes. So this next paper is uh, Language Specific Effects on Automatic Speech Recognition Errors for World Englishes. Uh, and it is from uh, Koling, like I mentioned, 2022, uh, by Jun Cho, C-H-O-E. Cho, probably. Again, apologies if I'm getting this wrong. Feel free to correct me in the chat. Uh, Iran Chen, May Pick You Chan, I Ni Li, Xin Gao and Nicole Holliday uh, from the University of Pennsylvania Department of Linguistics. Um, and I will say that uh, I know Nicole, so uh, I have a, a personal knowledge of at least one of these authors. I may have met some of these other folks at some point, uh, but uh, if so, I, I don't remember it. Um, possibly. Because the last time I attended a sociolinguistics conference was a while ago, and I've never been to Koling, so um, question mark. Uh, so to read the abstract, despite recent advancements in automated speech recognition technologies, reports of unequal performance against uh, of unequal performance against speakers of different demographic groups abound. Um, this is one of the things that I did research on in graduate school. It is still the case, has not been fixed. Uh, very difficult problem, I will say, uh, both from a signal processing and also natural language processing um, sort of underlying dialectal variation standpoint, um, or in this case, you know, second language variation standpoint. Um, but the fact remains that the problem is there. Uh, at the same time, the focus on performance metrics, such as word error rate, in prior studies limit the specificity and scope of recommendations that can be offered for system engineering to overcome these challenges. So saying if you're just counting the number of errors by a group of people, um, you're limited in what you can tell folks to do. 
The current study bridges this gap by investigating the performance of Otter's automatic captioning. Uh, Otter is a, a tech company that does um, meeting captioning. Uh, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, Otter's automatic captioning system on native and non-native English speakers of different language backgrounds through a linguistic analysis of segment level errors. By examining language specific error profiles for vowels and consonants motivated by linguistic theory, uh, which uh, is probably what Nicole helped with, uh, knowing her research, uh, we find that certain categories of errors can be predicted from the phonological structure of the speaker's native language. And I would say this sort of study is a catnip to me. <laughs> uh, super well linguistically grounded on a research topic that I have worked on. Um, and just like some signs here that like, oh yeah, this is grounded in, um, uh, in linguistic theory. World Englishes is the term that linguists would use to talk about the um, English varieties found globally. Um, so yeah, also segment level. We love segment level stuff. So we're not just looking at word error rate. We're looking at errors in, uh, it looks like the, the phonemic level, possibly knowing Nicole's work, there may also be some work on tone in here. So let's dive in a little bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jerome says, Whisper has solved the issue, hasn't it? No, Whisper has not solved the issue. Um, Whisper has its own pretty big issues. Uh, yeah, we read the Whisper paper on the channel a couple weeks back, if you want to go back and, and read that. Um, and I would say that in general, I was unimpressed with, uh, in particular, their data collection uh, and labeling, uh, and also some of their kind of weird normalization practices. And by weird, I just mean like non-standard in the field. So, yes. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, cognition says interesting citation on the right oh <laughs> well <laughs> someone has uh has detected that they've cited my work yes uh so the tapman caston paper was uh from interspeech in 2017 uh looking at uh little little law tech bib tech error there uh looking at the um error rate across different systems. Uh, and, you know, it's obtained. There's been some work at Stanford on it that's uh, continued to show it. There was a proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences paper. Um, but yet, yeah, continues to be a thing. Uh... <laughs> Nine Gaming says, Meta is hyping up their new speech to speech translation. What? Meta hyping things up? No. Uh, what a surprise. Um... Yeah, I'm. Uh... Uh, Welfare says, uh, first time chatter, welcome. Uh, what platforms am I streaming on and do I have a preferred one that I'm trying to grow? So I stream simultaneously on Twitter and Twitter, Twitch and YouTube. Uh, and I am perfectly fine with you tuning in however you like. Um, also this uh, stream in particular is also uploaded as a podcast on iTunes and Spotify, um, if you would like that. So uh, thank you for asking Valfer. That's a very sweet question, but wherever is most convenient for you. Uh, oh, some discussion. So Lisa says, why do you need an AI to predict whether someone should get the death penalty? Uh, and if then Pascal procedure would do that in a heartbeat. And Jerome says, uh, to illustrate that ethics is quite different subject, uh, is a different subject from laws where the laws are firmer and the ethics are more flexible. Um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, agree <laughs> with that statement. Um, I think there is so I had a personal journey where at some point in the past, I also thought that the legal system, so I'm in the United States just for, um, you know, uh, information here. Um, I, you know, had a lot of beliefs about the legal system that I've been particularly taught as, as a child, um, that, you know, it was really straightforward, that if you didn't break the law, you'd be fine, um, that most laws were, you know, very reasonable, um, and that, <laughs> to be frank, <laughs> that the U.S. justice system works and it works as intended. Um, and unfortunately, the older I've gotten and the more that I've learned and the more that I have talked to lawyers and people who work in the legal system and adjacent to the legal system, uh, the more I have discovered that that is in fact extremely not the case. Um, you know, laws are enforced at the discretion of um, in the United States. Um, you know, there is a sometimes elected, sometimes appointed uh, 
position called the district attorney that basically decides what to prosecute and how much to prosecute, right? Um, and some things just never get prosecuted and somebody clearly broke the law and they just nothing is ever done about it. Uh, and some things where, you know, most people would say that having broken that particular law is probably not that big a deal, get really strongly uh, prosecuted. Uh, and yes, I would say that the application of the law and the interpretation of the law are both extremely subjective. Um, which is also true of ethics. Um, and of course, you know, different legal systems are going to, to behave differently. Um, but there is, you know, laws are language and language is ambiguous. Um, not all language is ambiguous, but if you are really trying very hard and there are people whose jobs it is to try very hard, um, you can interpret laws in a number of different ways to your, you know, your benefit and your person that you're talking to is detriment. So um, yes, I I get where you're coming from. I definitely used to believe that at one point, uh, and I have spent too much time talking to lawyers to believe that anymore, unfortunately. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Falfer says, works as intended. <laughs> it could be working as intended. Yes, I definitely think there are people who um, benefit from the legal system being set up the way that it is, uh, particularly people who directly uh, profit from the prison system here in the United States. Um, the United States, for those of you who are not aware, has the highest incarceration rate of pretty much any country. Uh, Cognition says prosecutor prosecutorial discretion is an important concept, but a very double-edged sword. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think the idea that like laws work like computers and are always, you know, on off, yes, no, is unfortunately uh, not reflected in the way that the system treats human beings. Yeah. All right. Uh Oh, sorry, back to this paper. <laughs> Language specific effects on automatic speech recognition uh, errors for world English. Uh, so they were looking at Otter, um, which uh, I had not seen this before. Uh, Otter claims to be able to handle a lot of, um, you know, second language groups. So uh, accents uh, claiming I'm just going to read this. Uh, transcription claimed to support multiple varieties of English, including Southern American. Um, I think what they mean there is people from the south of the United States, the southeast of the US, which people in the United States will call the south. Uh, Canadian, Indian, Chinese, Russian, British, Scottish, Italian, German, Swiss, Irish, Scandinavian, and other European accents. Um, or perhaps they mean people from South America. I'm not entirely clear about that. That appears to be um, um, ambiguous. Um, however, obviously there are, I would say that Canadian accents are not, uh, you know, Canadian, Indian, uh, British, Scottish, these are all places that have large populations of native English speakers. Um, so Irish also. Uh, so they claim to have pretty good uh, coverage of both a range of native dialects and then also second language uh, speakers. Uh, and they've got a global user base uh, and they're, you know, they claim to be able to handle this. So I think this is a fair analysis of this system. Uh, they use the Speech Accent Archive, really good resource. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Jerome says, don't mess with Texas. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's a little bit of a fuzzy question about whether or not Texas is part of the South. Um, Some people will say yes, but in my experience, people from Texas tend to say that they are from Texas. Um, and you know, if the South want to come along with Texas, that's fine. Uh, and people from outside of Texas, but in the South, like me, uh, will often not include Texas in the South. It, it, Texas is its own thing, you know? Um, also, there are people who will say that Virginia is not part of the South, uh, despite sort of like historical cultural stuff. Um, and I would say that sort of like the line of where culturally the South begins goes through the middle of Virginia. Uh, and I am in Richmond, Virginia, and um, I think you'd be pretty hard pressed to claim that this isn't the South for, for good or real. Anyway, um, which is to say, this is a language variety that I'm very familiar with. 
Uh, all right, so they're only looking at the varieties that Otter says that they can handle. Uh, they're doing a lot of pre-processing. Uh, and then they look at the uh, segment layer, layer level error analysis. So they are particularly looking at phone error rate. Phone here, not like ring, ring telephone, uh, but as a um, shortening and also sort of um, theoretical hands-offness about talking about language sounds at the segment level, right? So they're not committing to this being like a phoneme or an allophone, uh, et cetera. They're not making any theoretical claims about these language segments besides the fact that they are language sounds. Um, so yeah, phones, sound segments. <laughs> uh, Valper says, South, y'all or dare fixing to you. Uh, we aren't easy to understand sometimes. I mean, everyone's language variety is, uh, you know, uh, easy to understand for people who share that language variety. Uh, Louisiana shout out. Oh, hey. Uh, my, uh, my neighbors are from Louisiana, actually. Uh... <laughs> But yes, there's a lot of things in um, Southern English, Southern American English, um, that are distinct from other regional varieties. Uh, for example, we have the correct number of vowels, and y'all got rid of one. <laughs> uh, not not everyone necessarily. Some of the folks on the, the Eastern Seaboard still have the ah ah distinction. Um, but for example, nobody on the West Coast does. All right, so we're looking at the phone error rate. Um, so ask would be ask uh, vowelsk. Um, this AE is the uh, CMU um, ARPABET, A-R-P-A-B-E-T, um, is the sort of ASCII-based representation of um, the um, underlying single sound. So that is one vowel that is represented with AE. Oh, here it is, ARPABET. That's the one. Uh, all right, so let's go down to the results because that's what I'm really interested in. Oh. Oh, we got, <laughs> uh, I said we weren't going to talk a whole bunch about, uh, uh, you know, uh, linguistic theory, but it looks like we're getting into it a little bit. Uh, so, all right, let's just get into it. You know, I'm feeling in a, in a linguistic -y sort of mood. Um, so, uh, English has pretty lineant construction allowances when it comes to consonant clusters. So consonants are sound segments that are not vowels. Uh, vowels are made with an open vocal tract. So things like e, a, u, a, 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 e, e, uh, etc. Those are all vowels. And things like patikaba, uh, ng, s, v, all consonants. Um, and a consonant cluster is when multiple consonants come uh, adjacent to a vowel within a syllable. Um, <laughs> uh, and I don't want to get <clears throat> too deep into what syllables are, uh, but basically uh, they're uh, units of metrical weight within a word. Some words will have one, so the word stop, S-T-O-P, is a single syllable um, with ah as the vowel, or ah, depending on where you're from, uh, p as the coda, so everything in that syllable that comes after the vowel is called the coda. Everything in that syllable that comes before the vowel is called the onset. Uh, in English, we allow, uh, right, so stop is a fine word. Um, ST, that's two consonants, so that is a cluster before the, before the, before the nucleus is what the vowel is called. Um, and we could also say stops with a PS, two consonants after the, uh, the vowel. Um, so as you can see, English allows um, both onset and coda uh, constant clusters. So does German, French, Spanish, Russian, and Swedish. Uh, Swiss German does not allow uh, complex codas. Uh, Italian and Bengali allow complex onsets, but not codas. Uh, Hindi, Urdu, and Dari allow uh, consent codas, co allow complex codas, so codas with clusters, uh, but not onsets. And then uh, Mandarin, Cantonese, Japanese, Korean, Thai, Vietnamese, Indonesian, Arabic, Amharic, and Tagalog uh, only allow consonant vowel consonant as the absolute maximum uh, syllable that you can have. Um, so English really likes, uh, you know, we're pretty cluster rich as world languages go, uh, consonant cluster rich. Um, certainly not the most consonant cluster rich, but it's up there. Uh, and then we have, uh, 
uh, distinctions in uh, voicing and aspiration. Uh, so in English, we have voiced and unvoiced stops, and we have aspirated and unaspirated stops. Those are just qualities of sounds. I don't want to get into them too much. Uh, and I think that this is actually wrong for Hindi. Coding of language stop voicing and aspiration contrasts. Language in bold is used the group name. Numbers represent each language category in the topology. Okay, so I don't think this is actually the count. What's the topology? Ah, okay. Uh, so one is not the number of uh, distinctions they have. It is that they have a true voicing contrast, uh, which uh, Hindi does. Uh, then those that have voicing contrast but are not realized as true voicing and those that have no voicing contrast. Uh, interesting. So I think the fact that English has uh, two here is because word initially um, we use aspiration instead of voicing, uh, even though word medially and on the on the on the coda you can't have. this is really deep in the weeds sorry i know this is more than <laughs> most of you care about uh in terms of of linguistics uh, but anyway languages differ this is a uh one way in which they differ is you know how many sounds that they have basically uh and okay so now we're looking at how many errors uh occurred at the various phone level, so the speech sound level, based on the uh, language, the speakers, I believe first language is what they're doing here. So if you speak English or a language like English, you uh, got far fewer errors in uh, voicing, right? So a voicing error would be, um, I think they were specifically talking about stops, so a ba, uh, the, the B sound in English, a ba is voiced, a pa uh, is not voiced, the P sound in English. So a ba, a pa. Uh, and if you put your hand on your voice box and you go pa, 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 you shouldn't feel any vibration. And if you go ba, 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 you should. And that's what voicing is. It's a uh, um, vibration of the larynx. This, uh, this is super linguistic-y. <laughs> uh, Cognition says, I was like, voicing, aspiration, got it. But of course it's more complicated. Of course it's more complicated. Uh, especially when you're working with a, a very, um, not just a data set that has a lot of languages, but a lot of languages that are not closely related to each other. Um, and if you speak a language that is not like Hindi, you are much more likely to get errors with uh, languages grouped with Mandarin, so that's Mandarin and Cantonese having the most errors. Uh, languages like French, so French, Amharic, Russian, Italian, Arabic, Adari, Spanish, and Tagalog having the second most errors, uh, and then Hindi, and then Japanese. Um, so the Hindi type languages, and again, these are languages that are following these patterns. They don't have a typological relationship to each other, um, such as Vietnamese, Thai, Bengali, Bengali, Indonesian, Swedish, and Urdu um, had the second most errors and the least errors with the Japanese type, which is Japanese and Korean. Uh, I want to say Korean also has like a voicing type distinction. I want to say, I want to say Korean has uh, like a glottal voice. One sec. Korean voicing contrasts. And I'm just going to add a uh, phonology in there as a search term, just so I don't get a bunch of uh, Korean phonology. Yep. Uh, da, 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 da. Consonants. Uh, yes. Oh, that's right. They've got that uh, Lenis Fortis distinction. Um, yeah. Okay, and no one can agree exactly what they uh, that is, uh, but they also have aspiration. Okay, that's what I was thinking of. They have sort of like a uh, glottalized. Yep, the tense segments also referred to as forward is hard or glottalized have eluded precise description uh, and have been the subject of considerable phonetic investigation. So yes, there's also a second voicing distinction that Korean has that is probably not super well reflected here. Um, but anyway, so those are the qualities of the speaker's first languages, and it appears that the quality of your first language does have a pretty big distinction, a pretty big effect on how many errors you get per segment, 
how likely uh, a specific sound segment is to be recognized incorrectly. Uh, and yeah, that's it. That's, that's the, the finding there. Um, and also, it looks like if you speak a language that uh, has neither allowable consonant clusters has does not allow consonant clusters neither the onset or coda you are likely to get way more errors than uh, a language that allows at least some of them um, so english here would be in this bottom uh, row the onset coda no yeah. uh Drum says, it's not too much into linguistics. Uh, I'm helping you fill in the blanks. Oh, thank you. I'm surprised about the error rate for the French type. English and French uh, don't seem so distant, but the error rate is high. Great question. So I think uh, French here is uh, taking in all of these languages, right? So uh, they have a voicing contrast, uh, but it is not realized as true voicing. No, wait, sorry. It, they have a true voicing contrast, which English doesn't. Um, arguable. Uh, that, that is a, a theoretical position that they are, that they are taking, but I, I'm not going to disagree on the face of it. Um, right? So the French type languages are the languages that do have a voicing contrast. And then... Uh, where is the discussion of the aspiration? Because there's two of them. So I'm guessing that the first one, oh, reference of table two, kind of five types according to these two dimensions. Uh, okay, yes. So is there a phonemic aspiration contrast? Uh, so one is yes and two is no. Uh, okay, so Hindi is correct. So that there is both a voicing and aspiration contrast. So if you can think about this as like uh, the number of sounds, right? So if you think about a square, <laughs> right? So you have uh, voiced, voiceless, aspirated, unaspirated. In Hindi, you'd have four separate uh, sounds that fit in there, right? So you have a voice sound that's aspirated, an unvoiced sound that isn't aspirated, a, I changed both in the same time. So you have a voice and voiceless sound, a, both aspirated and you have a voiced and voiceless sound neither aspirated so you have a lot of different segments based on the the distinction here aspiration is like a little sort of like a puff of air um whereas in the french class you have a voicing distinction but not an aspiration distinction uh so you have a um uh right you have a voiced and a voiceless sound, but you don't have a voiced aspirated and a voiced unaspirated sound, and a voiceless aspirated and a voiceless unaspirated sound. Um, and in English and German, I'm guessing, um, we have sort of like the the corners kind of. So um, in specifically word initially, a voiceless sound in English is always going to be aspirated and an unvoiced sound is always going to be unaspirated. So you have sort of the, the corners there, but not the other two. Uh, and in the sort of the French language, you have the row, but not the columns. And then in the uh, Hindi type languages, you have the columns, but not the rows. And in the Japanese type language, you have the column, but not the row. Row, but not the column. Yeah, you've got the other one. Wait one sec, let me think. So you don't have a voicing contrast, but you do have an aspiration contrast. And I don't remember which I assigned to the columns and which I assigned to the rows. Um, but that's the basic idea. Oof. <laughs> uh, yes, hopefully that was helpful. Um, so these languages that are grouped that are called French here are French type, and there are a lot of um, very unrelated languages. So like uh, Amharic is, I believe, Semitic. Oh, don't quote me on that. Uh, Italian is Indo-European. Um, it's Romance. Uh, Arabic is... Uh... Hold, please. <laughs> I'm looking up language families. Uh, I don't want to say wrong things. 
what all is in the Semitic family? Do, 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 do. Uh, so Amharic is Semitic. I was right about that. Arabic is Semitic. Yeah, so Arabic and Amharic are quite closely related. Um, Tagalog is, oh, I think that's one of the ones that's kind of... Uh, uh, for those of you who are, are um, not familiar with language topology, uh, particularly the sort of like islands uh, of the Pacific, the topology of those languages is uh, very complex uh, and sort of an open question about who migrated where, when, um, and how much we can get from uh, Sorry, I continue to put the wrong vowels in Tagalog, which is not super helpful. Uh, da, da, da. Austronesian is the, the general uh, language family, uh, according to Wikipedia, um, which I think some people would disagree with. Um, so very unrelated languages. Oh, that was a long aside. <laughs> um, but yes, so that is looking at the, uh, the stops. And the second part is about vowels, which is going to be completely different. Um, and I don't want to go into the same degree of depth here, uh, but we have sort of, oh, that's a good plot. Oh, mm, gorgeous. Great plot here. Uh, for those of you who are listening on the podcast, um, it is a grid uh, where each of the, the grid sections is a vowel plot for the target language. Um, so all the target languages that we talked about. Uh, and then the uh, sort of, there's a heat map behind it showing the amount of variation uh, within across speaker normalized, so across speakers. Um, and if we look at uh, the English Canadian one, you can see there's very little variation. So there's sort of like very tight little mm, heat map right behind the vowel labels. But if you look at a lot of the other languages, you can see that there is a lot more variation in each of the labels uh, and where they map to. Um, so, and then this level here is correctly identified vowels. The density contours are contracted from the distribution of incorrectly uh, identified vowels, aka the highest density uh, region estimation. Okay, sorry. So this is not, this is error rates of the system. This is not uh, production by the speakers. Um, so for different languages, different places have a higher error rate. So in Vietnamese, the E vowel is the most misrecognized one, whereas the A and U vowels are pretty well recognized. Uh, for Japanese, the U vowel is the most misrecognized. Uh, the A vowel is fine. For Swiss German, the U vowel is highly misrecognized. Um, for Hindi, uh, the sort of the space between E and A, um, so like an E vowel is uh, the least recognized in, um, has the most errors for Hindi speakers. Uh, and uh, for, for Dari, ah has a lot of errors around it, E has fewer errors. So the, the point that they're trying to get across with this gaff, graph is um, the native language of the speaker affects where, uh, what vowels are most miscategorized by the uh, otter recognition system. <laughs> um, and if you're not familiar with the vowel chart, so if you imagine if I'm looking, kind of look the right way, this way, um, it is a sort of stylized representation of the oral cavity. So, uh, and then the, the position of the tongue root um, within the oral cavity. So E is a high front vowel, the tongue root is lifted and pressed forward. Ah is a low back vowel, so the tongue root is depressed and pulled back, um, which is why when you go to the dentist or someone's trying to look at your tonsils, they'll ask you to say ah, saying that vowel pulls your tongue down and back and out of the way. Uh, if you said E instead, they wouldn't be able to see anything. Uh, so that's the, that's the point there, which great graph. Love it. Um, really, really nice data visualization and, uh, a cool finding. So 
that's this paper that we've spent like an hour on, <laughs> but it was a good paper. Uh, so great work to uh, Jun Cho and co-authors. Uh, fabulous paper, uh, well-deserved acceptance, and really, really good work. Love it. All right, next up. <laughs> we are. I have like 50 tabs open, and we are on three. Uh, so next up, we have a, a paper, this one's also from Koling, uh, Analyzing the Dialect Diversity in Multi-Document Summaries, uh, and it is by four authors from Portland State University, Olu Buseo, uh, Olabisi, again, apologies if I mispronounce anyone's name, Aaron Hudson, and Tony Jetter, I'm guessing, and then Amita Agrawal. Again, apologies if I mispronounce anyone's name. Uh, and I'll just read the abstract. Uh, social media posts provide a compelling yet challenging source of data of diverse perspectives from many socially salient groups. Automatic text summarization algorithms make this data accessible at stale by compressing large collections of documents into short summaries that preserve salient information from the source text. Like, ideally, <laughs> that's how we would like it to work. Uh, in this work, we can take a complementary approach to analyzing and improving the quality of summaries generated from social media data in terms of their ability to represent salient as well as diverse perspectives. Uh, uh, we introduce a novel data set, DivSum, D-I-V-S-U-M-M, -M, of dialect-diverse tweets and human-written extractive and abstractive summaries. Oh. Then we study the extent of dialect diversity reflected in human-written reference summaries, as well as system-generated summaries. The results of our extensive experiments suggest that humans annotate fairly well-balanced dialect diversity summaries, and that cluster-based pre-processing approaches seem beneficial in improving the overall quality of the system-generated summaries without a loss in diversity. Okay, so they created a data set uh, of dialect diverse tweets. So they got tweets from folks who use a bunch of different dialects. Uh, and then they have handwritten extractive and abstractive summaries. Um, so extractive is um, it's sort of like uh, found poetry, right? You look at the text and you extract uh, the relevant parts of it that give you a summary and remove everything else. Abstractive is you rewrite the text in your own words. Uh, and then they sort of like, look how well folks can handle that. Uh, actually, one sec. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Yes. So I'm really interested in, uh... oh, okay. So these are other dialects, sorry. <laughs> uh, I was looking at this uh, data set that was talking about uh, different, uh... okay. Uh... Sorry, I did two things here. So they're talking about other related data sets that do stuff similar. So this one that looks at gender, this one that looks at gender, this one that looks at political affiliation. Um, and I noticed that these were all by uh, the same first author and that scroll up was me to check if that was the first author of this paper as well, but it is not. Uh, and then they are looking at three dialects in this paper and what dialects are they working on? Related work, yes, yes, yes. Representation gap, yes, yes, yes. Cool math. Uh, what are the dialects? Okay, so they these are ethnolex. Um, quibble number one. <laughs> Let me quickly. Okay, yes, and they never use the word ethnolect. So. Um, the dialects quote that they are uh, using are African American English, Hispanic English, also called Ch Chicano English, and then um, White English. Um, and uh, yeah, I would argue that White East English is kind of not an ethnolect, but uh, Chicano English and African American English are, and those are language varieties that are associated more with people uh, who share an ethnic background. Um, there are more ethnolects uh, among people who would be considered white in, uh, for example, Canada, um, due to sort of historical immigration patterns and um, not moving around, basically, <laughs> is the thing. So, uh, yes, those are the three things that they are looking at. 
Uh, so it looks like a useful uh, data set if you're working on those particular, um, mm, you, what am I looking for? In those particular dialects, ethnolex. Uh, and then they're just sort of looking at the, what does this figure say? I'm just scrolling and look at the, at the figures. Um, violin plots of R of S per dialect and poor approach. So I believe this is the representation score that they are looking at. Uh, so what they are looking at here is, are these dialects being ranked, appro being clustered appropriately in a way that maintains the original representation? Um, so here are their uh, text rankings uh, of the different dialects. Coffee. Hmm. Uh, and basically what they're showing here is that, look, these violin plots all overlap. Um, the representativeness of these dialects across the clusters is good, which means that the clusters are not being created just by looking at the dialect features, but are instead being uh, created looking at the, you know, the thing that they're interested in, in uh, clustering on. So, uh, interesting paper if you're working on these uh, uh, particular um, topics, I would say it seems to be a little bit less linguistically grounded than the last one. Uh, next up, uh, this is another preprint, uh, and I had originally intended to talk about this one and the first one about using a human rights framework together, but apparently I did not reorder the links. Whoopsie. Uh, so this paper is a preprint. It's titled Sociotechnical Harms, Scoping a Taxonomy for Harm Reduction, uh, and it is by Renee Shelby, Shalala Rismani. Catherine Henny, Hen, Henne, mm -hmm, potentially, uh, A Jung Moon, Najar, perhaps, uh, Rostamzade. Again, I am so sorry if I mispronounce anybody's name, uh, and please do correct me. <laughs> Paul Nicholas, uh, Nama Yilla, Jess Galagos. Andrew Smart, Emilio Garcia, and Gerlene Verk are the authors. <laughs> and again, uh, huge apologies to anyone if I uh, just completely, absolutely said your name incorrectly. Uh, but names, particularly in this setting where I have very li limited information about like what language it came from uh, are it's just difficult for me. Uh, yeah. Oh, Valper says, uh, I really like the violin plots, well preferred over box plots. Yeah, I like a violin plot too. I also like um, uh, B plots. I think they're also called swarm plots. Let's see. Uh, which tend to work a little bit better with um, a smaller number of. Uh, uh, a smaller number of data points, uh, but it gives you just like a really mm, visceral, <laughs> a really visceral uh, 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 way of looking at the data. There we go. Here, I'll just uh, we can look at this real quick. Uh, so for those of you who are listening, I'm looking at the Seaborn documentation for swarm plots. Um, and it's the same thing, except you get, you know, instead of uh, drawing a density estimation curve like you would with a violin plot, you plot the actual points. Um, and it, uh, yeah, looks like that. Big fan of swarm plots. If you, if you uh, really prefer violin plots over box plots, perhaps you'll also like swarm plots was the whole, whole aside there. Uh, yes. So... Uh, yeah, let's read the abstract and then talk about it. Understanding the landscape of potential harms from algorithmic systems enables practitioners to better anticipate consequences of the systems they build. It also supports the prospect of incorporating controls to help minimize harms that emerge from the interplay of technologies and social and cultural dynamics. A growing body of scholarship has identified a wide range of harms across different algorithmic technologies. However, computing resources 
No, computing research and practitioners lack a high level and synthesized overview of harms from algorithmic system arising at the micro, meso, and macro levels of society. We present an applied taxonomy of sociotechnical harms to support a more systematic surfacing of potential harms in algorithmic systems. Based on a scoping review of computing research, uh, 172, they read a lot of papers, is that what that means? We identified five major themes related to sociotechnical harms, representational, allocative, quality of service, interpersonal, and social systems slash societal harms, and sub-themes. We describe these categories and conclude with a discussion of challenges and opportunities for future research. So basically what they're saying is like, hey, you're building something, um, the technology, it's going to be used by people in a social situation. Um, so how do you think about the potential harms that may arise, right? So harm reduction uh, is a framework saying like harm is bad and we should do less of it. Um, which I realize may sound like an obvious statement, but there are certainly uh, uh, ethical philosophies that don't, <laughs> don't center harm reduction. Uh, it's something that I personally am a fan of, which is why I was drawn to this paper in the first place. Um, Yes. So what they're doing is they're pulling together a bunch of, uh, they're looking through a bunch of papers um, and sort of identifying the types of harms that are discussed there. Uh, and then uh, talking about how those arise from people using systems in society. You live in a society, we all do, where uh, humans are pretty social as animals go. Um, so the micro, small, interpersonal, meso, middle, uh, and then macro level of society. Uh, and then the harms, representational, allocative, uh, quality of service, interpersonal, and uh, social system slash societal harms. Um, so representational is like you are being represented in an unfair way. So like stereotyping, allocative, you don't get the resources you need. Uh, quality of service, the thing is bad to use. So the ASR systems, I'd say, would, would be quality of service. Uh, but if you're using an ASR system for like determining who gets disability benefits, then it could also be allocative. Um, or if you are, you know, using a, a TTS system to produce language to represent, let's say, somebody from a particular social background, then it could be representational, uh, interpersonal, person A, harms person B. Um, I think the, like, the deep fake porn is a great example of that. Um, and then social system slash societal harms, right? So um, like the recent thing where Kenya's, uh, during Kenya's election, Facebook was selling ads to uh, that were proposing doing genocide. Um, obviously that does harm to the society that that is deployed in. That's the general thing. Um, I'll post a link to this. I don't want to go to it in too much depth, but it is a different way of thinking about harms that is not purely rights-based. <laughs> Valpho was like, yes, swarm plots are great. Um, yeah. Uh, next up, uh, you need to go, shoo, shoo. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you could say that, but I got a, a, a pop-up from a, a add-on I'm using. Um, so this is an accepted EMNLP paper. Um, EMNLP is a... I think originally it also wasn't an ACL conference, but it is now... Wait. I think EMNLP is an ACL conference. One sec. I'm having a moment of uh, distrust. Are you run by the ACL? It is organized. Oh, it's organized by SIGDAT. Okay. Um, yes, it is an ACL conference. Uh, and the acceptances where we're going out this week. So uh, we will talk more about that. Uh, and I thought this, uh, also poor Kevin, <laughs> that handle absolutely looks like a bot wrote it. Um, but Kevin Young is a fourth year PhD student at UC Berkeley working with Dan Klein, interested in control generation and long form story generation. Um, so uh, the paper is RE3, generating longer stories with recursive reprompting and revision. Uh, 
And one second, let me make sure I've got my chat visible. I accidentally uh, was not looking at the Twitch chat for a while on Tuesday and I felt very bad. So I'm trying to keep an eye on it. Uh, so here is an example of the generated story, which is quite long. If you're not familiar with story generation work, um, sort of the early work was really uh, templatic where you'd sort of fill in the things. Um, and uh, obviously with, um, you know, this <laughs> GPT-3 and other large language models, there's been a push towards that. But any of you who've worked with uh, large language models know uh, there's a problem with coherence, right? There's not like a clear path, narrative path throughout, unless there's a person grounding it usually. Um, and you also get problems with sort of like uh, degenerate outputs. You'll get like repetition or um, just non-fluent output if you continue to put out strings that are long enough, which is why that work on, you know, very long distance and long span transformers that came out last year, people were so excited about. I think it was last year. We talked about it on the channel. If we talked about it on the channel, it had to have been within the last couple of months. My God, <laughs> the field moved so fast. Uh, so here is uh, the generated story. It starts with a prompt. Uh, AI researchers Kevin Yondong Nanyun and Dan create a system for automatically generating high quality long stories, aiming to submit their work to a previous prestigious conference. Uh, and then there are 80 words of generated story that I guess are just delighted here. Um, Kevin walked over to his desk and sat down, looking at it with disgust. There was a pile of manila folders on top, which contained detailed notes of his latest experiments for writing programs using neural languages, neural networks for language processing. I'm not entirely sure what the green is here. I would assume that that is a human prompt or possibly revision. Uh, Kevin started to read through the file, thoroughly detailing his latest results on language processing that were designed to write reasonably long and coherent text automatically with minimal supervision or guidance from human inputs. Uh, there is a agreement error there that I'm having a hard time resolving. Uh, he recalled the effort that led to this final result. They were lucky to manage to get their hands on two excellent researchers, Nanyun Zhang, that's a, that's a weird way to talk about researchers, <laughs> and Yuan Dong Li. Um, Kevin's eyes were caught by one number that was highlighted in the last report. This number represented the new algorithm's ability. Anyway, so it's sort of like a ongoing uh, thing. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure what the different colors are here, but this is sort of their example. Uh, and the approach that they take is that uh, there is a premise uh, and then they generate the uh, setting characters and outline by prompting a language model. Uh, and then there's a recursive three steps that starts by drafting, write continuous story, story continuations by prompting based on the plan and previous story, write, rewrite, rank, re-rank story continu continuations for plot continuance and premise relevance, edit, edit selected continuation to maintain long range factual consistency, and then going back to draft. Uh, and then finally you get the story. Um, so there are multiple stages. There's sort of like a recursive planning, rethinking about it stage. Um, sounds like you might have to do like a lot of prompting to do this. So it may be, may be quite expensive depending on the model you're using. Um, okay, so the original uh, premise, you have the model uh, produce a setting, characters, and outline. Uh, and then to generate each next story continuation, the draft module selects the most relevant pieces of the plan uh, and previously generated story and recombines them into a single prompt to generate the next passage. Uh, compared to existing chain of thought approaches, this story drafting system can be viewed as going a step further. It dynamically selects part of the previous language model outputs relevant to the current step and runs some additional processing like summarization when needed. Uh, the rewrite module mimics human rewriting by re-ranking continuations via a mix, mix of relevant scoring, coherent scoring, and simple heuristic filters. Uh, so they're optimizing for um, you know these various types of scores to detect which is the best bit uh, that they want to use out of the generated options. Training re-rankers is the only place where we use pre-existing story data. All generation modules are zero shot via prompting. So they use the you know existing information on the internet uh, to give them a warm start. 
Uh, and then finally, the edit module tackles the extremely difficult challenge of detecting and correcting long range factual inconsistencies. So this I think is probably the most um, interesting to me because of course, long range uh, agreement uh, across generated text, particularly neurally generated text is uh, a thing. Again, for those of you who have used large language models, um, you, you'll have run into this. Uh, so, uh, our edit module detection system is a proof of concept open IE inspired system based on breaking down the process into simple GPT-3 queries, while our correction system uses GPT-3's edit API. I'm not familiar with that API. Uh, a lot more interesting work to be done on this front. Um, so what's going on in the edit is they have uh, a continuation and then they have some inferred facts, uh, and in tribute dictionary. Uh, an editing instruction to say how to edit the output. Okay, so this must be where they're using the edit API uh, and then the correction. Uh, so yeah, I think this is probably for me the most interesting part of this paper. And um, yeah, if you're interested in long range story, long story generation might be uh, an interesting read for you. Uh, and there is a paper as well, uh, but you know, if I'm leaning towards if the author has written a Twitter thread to look at the Twitter thread instead, because I think it's just easier to read on stream. Uh, but if you are interested, I'll, I'll get you the uh, the archive link as well. Uh, and the system, again, name is RE3, three being the numeral three there. All right, and then we have our final paper, and I want to say this was accepted. I'm pretty sure this was an accepted EMNLP as well. Uh... Although now that I have said that, I am immediately second guessing myself. Hold, please. <laughs> um, da, 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 da. I'm just gonna double check. Uh, maybe it's a preprint. Anyway, it seems very uh, useful. So uh, it is by. This person's first name is M-A-C-H-E-L, which it's spelled like Rachel, right? So it could be Mackle, or it could be Michael, because Michael and Rachel rhyme, even though they are spelled differently. So could be Machel. I'm gonna guess Michael, because that seems like the most likely thing. Uh, Michael Reed, Victor Zhang, uh, Su Chin, uh, Gururangan, again, apologies if I mispronounce anyone's name, and uh, Luke Settlemoyer, uh, and I have a current institutional affiliation with the University of Washington. I'm uh, you know, adjuncting there at the moment, so um, conflict of interest told to y'all. Uh, and it's a data set, MD, M2D2, uh, or I should be the title, a massively multi-domain language modeling data set. Um, those of you who've been on the channel for a while, or if you've bought my book, uh, The Nine Most Common Language Technology Mistakes and How to Avoid Them, uh, you know that domain mismatch is a huge problem in the field. Um, so when I saw a multi-domain data set, I got very excited. Uh... And I'll read the abstracts and then just sort of like talk about what's in it. Uh, we present M2D2, a fine-grained, massively multi-domain corpus for studying domain adaptation and language models. I mean, you could use it for anything, but that's why they built it. Uh, 8.5 billion tokens and spans 145 uh, domains extracted from Wikipedia and Semantic Scholar. So Semantic Scholar is going to be academic text. Wikipedia, y'all know what Wikipedia is. Uh, using ontologies derived from Wikipedia and archive categories, we organize the domains in each data source into 22 groups. So I would say by domain here, they mean topic. They do not, they're not encompassing multiple domains in terms of like formality, uh, dialect region, etc. Uh, intended audience even, because I would say that, you know, scientific publishing, publishing and Wikipedia are both intended for a, uh, you know, serious slash scholarly audience. Uh, do, do, do we? It's a two-level hierarchy. Uh, enables the study of relationships between domains and their effects on in and out of domain performance after adaptation. We also present a number of insights into the nature of effective domain adaptation in language models uh, and examples of new types of studies. Um, so they also talk about language models, but for me, I think it's the data set that's really the interesting thing here. 
Uh, so there are two levels of the domain hierarchy. I'm just going to zoom way in on this figure. Uh, the main domains by by number are society and social, ranked by number, so the biggest one is society and social issues, human activities, uh, technology and applied sciences, culture and the arts, history and events, natural and physical sciences, philosophy and thinking, health and fitness, religion and belief systems, general reference, and mathematics and logic. Um, and then the subdomains for society is just society. <laughs> Which, uh, bless, <laughs> this This is certainly um, reflective of a lot of the folks working in computer science that I have uh, interacted with in, you know, my, my career over the years. Um, I probably would have done further breakdowns within that domain, but uh, human activities is mostly human activities. There's one tiny little slice of the pie that's a subdomain here. Uh, which is impact of human activities. That's very small. Uh, technology and applied sciences, predominantly agriculture, but also engineering, computing, and transport. Culture and the arts is broken down into culture and humanities, sports and recreation, visual arts, performing arts, games and toys, and then mass media, mass media being very small. History and events by period, by continent, and by region. Uh, natural and physical sciences is broken down into biology, physical sciences, nature and earth science. Philosophy and thinking is broken down into philosophy and thinking. Uh, health and fitness is broken down into public health, self-care, exercise, human science, human medicine, and nutrition. Uh, religion and belief systems are broken down into major beliefs of the world and Allah, A-L-L-H. Um, that's a way to break down religion and belief systems. Uh, general reference is broken down into reference works and further research tools and topics. Uh, and mathematics and logic is broken into mathematics, logic, and fields of mathematics. Um, and I would say I think this uh, kind of strange ontology um, probably comes predominantly from Semantic Scholar, which was originally intended to cover, uh, built to cover, you know, computational uh, and mathematical papers and has sort of like expended to include other things. Um, were I doing this, uh, I personally probably would have used um, a, uh, you know, information sciences or library sciences ontology. Um, so something like the Dewey Decimal System or the Library of Congress, um, which has, you know, similar big lumps, you know, smaller lumps to very, very finely detailed uh, topics. but. I did not put together this data set. Uh, and I think if you're working on domain adaptation or multi-domain work, uh, this could be a super useful research resource. So <laughs> Cognition says society. Hmm. Yes. Uh, quite the, quite the, the label. It's been an hour and a half and we've just finished the first section. All right, next up, practical stuff. Usually these go a little bit faster. Uh, the, we always take the longest on research because I get sidetracked and drawn in. And um, yeah, I did get a research degree. So probably that's just like reflective of me as a person and what I find intriguing. All right, practical stuff. Uh, Ugh, this one. Uh, so this is a story on the Washington Post uh, about sort of Amazon's dream home, um, which I believe is like a not a physical thing, right? Um, but uh, so it's a discussion of sort of like the the products that Amazon is is building and wants you to buy. Um, and the title is uh, Tour Amazon's Dream Home, where every appliance is also a spy. Uh, here's everything Amazon learns about your family, your home and you story by Jeffrey Fowler for the Washington Post. Um, and I'll post the link if you want to read it. Uh, but basically, it talks about the many, many, many types of data collection that Amazon is doing. Um, speaking of the law, um, yeah, I don't know if you knew this, but Amazon will just give ring to police departments if they ask for it. Uh, no warrant needed. Uh, and does that also apply to in-home devices? Question mark. I don't think we necessarily know as members of the public and, and civil society. So. Uh, Yes, my personal recommendation to you, colleague to colleague, is not to buy Amazon's spy tech. <laughs> but uh, you know, you're all, you're all. I hope you're adults. Um, yep, you you can make your own decisions. Cognition says, ah, yes, the utopian surveillance home. Yeah, uh, 
Yep. Certainly, probably uh, good for Amazon in terms of them making more money and cementing their, you know, overwhelming number of monopolies. Uh, next up, uh, yes, go away. Uh, nye. Uh, next up, so this project, it looks like, has been an absolute labor of love. Uh, it is by Aryaman Arora, <coughs> excuse me, um, at A-R-Y-A-M-A-N 2020 uh, on Twitter, who is a CS and Linguistics undergraduate at Georgetown and will be graduating in 2024. Uh, and it is a map of the languages of South Asia, so, you know, India and bordering countries, uh, and includes uh, information on the, uh, the speaker populations, the census speaker populations. Uh, I don't think it's gonna load with my current permissions. Uh, I'll pop the link to this in the chat. Um, <laughs> uh, Nine Gaming says, wait, doesn't Jeff Bezos own the Washington Post? Yep, sure does. Uh, thankfully, we have uh, tech reporters who are willing to report on technology. Uh, and you know what, bless them. Uh, I was mentioning in, I don't know if any of you have ever read Transmetropolitan. Um, it's, uh, I want to say it was from the 90s. Anyway, it was a comic series about an investigative reporter who um, lives in a dystopian future and uh, uses the power of reporting and information to, uh, you know, to bring justice to people. Uh, the, the name of the reporter is Spider Jerusalem. If you are interested and enjoy reading comics, I would recommend it. It is a good one. Uh, however, Something that has sort of occurred to me the older I get is that it was actually kind of like too optimistic about the future, uh, this dystopian uh, thing. So anyway, uh, but yes, anyway, I just wanted to highlight this fantastic piece of work. Um, we've talked on the channel often about the uh, incredible linguistic diversity of, uh, you know, Southern Asia, uh, particularly India and adjoining countries. You know, each of these colors here is a different majority language use in the, uh, the various geographic regions. Hey, puppy. Uh, he thinks it's lunchtime. <laughs> I am not even a quarter through the stream, but yeah, I know. Um, we may get a, be getting some some various upset wines from him. Uh, yes, so it's pulled from government documents. There's been some PDF scraping to get this information, a bunch of work to pull this all together. So uh, shout out to Aryaman uh, for this really, really great project. Uh, and if any of you are interested in it or working on languages of the area, I would, I would recommend checking it out. So really good work. Oh my gosh, is this going to be on every single one of these? <sighs> sure is. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, that's annoying. Anyway, uh, so this is, I think this is more for, you know, you to share with folks. I think it's not going to be as, you know, relevant uh, and uh, helpful to y'all because you're mostly technologists. Uh, but... Uh, it's a good thread on sort of like an introduction to critical AI studies and, you know, people who are not trying to sell you large language models talking about large language models, basically. Um, so a good, I don't know if you heard the, that, but that was the dog, uh, a good collection of resources. Uh, Cognition says, I hear such good things about Transmetropolitan all the time. Yeah. I will say, I haven't reread it in... A decade? Oh, time. Time and time is inexorable march. Um, so I don't know if it holds up right now, but uh, in my memory, it was very good. All right. Uh, ugh. Ugh. Uh, this one, this is another uh, anti-recommendation for me about buying stuff. Uh, so uh, there's a new electric SUV that unlocks with biometrics, uh, including a fingerprint reader. Um, and I also believe they're using uh, facial recognition from what I remember. Um, ah, <laughs> don't buy this. Um, in general, uh, I don't recommend using biometrics. For one thing, in the United States, there's... Um, uh, precedent that like if you have something that's locked with biometrics the police do not need a warrant to get into it um, so I guess now that includes your car so can they just search your car uh, if you have it locked with biometrics question mark question mark um, 
Yes, uh, and also, of course, you know, if a biometric database gets hacked, you cannot change your biometrics, so it is a huge security issue. Um, and I would just, I just don't, if you can, opt out. I wouldn't buy this car, uh, and I wouldn't choose to ride in this car if a friend had it. So that's my, my stance on that. Ah. <laughs> uh. Oh, and this is a big one. So I'll pop the link to this in chat as well. So this is written by a technologist who is a lawyer. Uh, like I always always say, I am not a lawyer. Uh, Matthew uh, Butterick, Butrick, Boudere, uh is a lawyer uh, and is uh, currently putting together a lawsuit against GitHub Copilot uh, for violating its legal duties to open source authors and end users. So uh, there's almost certainly going to be a court case out of this. Um, uh, and yeah, keep an eye on this space. Uh, this webpage describes an investigation of a potential lawsuit. General principles of law are discussed, but neither I nor anyone at the Joseph Severi Law Firm is your lawyer, and nothing here is offered as legal advice. Uh, hello, uh, Vidya Cigar. Welcome, welcome. Uh, yes, so basically they are it sounds like there is at least one case being put together against GitHub po Copilot for violating uh, the rights of open source, uh, the open source community, and I'm assuming violating the licenses of that open source. Um, so we've talked previously about you know, all large language models seem to memorize, even though there are penalties against it, uh, and can memorize and recite with as few as one example in the uh, underlying training test. Uh, that appears to be a pretty robust effect that it is difficult, if not impossible, to mitigate against. As a result, GitHub Copilot memorizes code and will recite code. Uh, and there's been a lot of uh, examples of people talking about this. So what does that mean legally? Question mark, you know, definitely motion towards putting together a uh, a court case here um, on behalf of open source communities, it sounds like. So my recommendation for you, again, just colleague to colleague, is I would not use GitHub Copilot in your work projects. Um, yes, just my general advice. Uh, and I'm really interested to see where this goes. Next up, Ugh, again, uh, one sec. Uh, yeah, so this is an interesting one. So I don't have my sound on, but um, basically this is a new text-to-speech company called Rhyme, R-I-M-E. Uh, this tweet is from Lily J. Clifford on Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, it's generative text-to-speech. And something that really stuck out at me is that in this little demo here, uh, there are various people's voices, including uh, famous politicians that are used as the example. Uh, and also you can uh, interpolate voices between those voices, right? Uh, so one of the examples here is an interpolation between Barack Obama and Malcolm Gladwell. Um, and also, you know, generated text for both of those people. Um, I, unless you have the explicit consent of a voice donor, I generally think that it is unethical to create uh, generated text using someone's voice. Um, so uh, when I talk about voice donors, there are situations where you can donate your voice. Uh, in particular, uh, the, the process of voice banking, uh, especially for creating voices for people who have, um, you know, uh, da, 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 da. Um, voice banking. I'm sorry, I'm looking for uh, the donation, uh, the donation standpoint of it. Da, da, da. Ah, Vocal ID is the company that I was thinking of. Um, so this is a way where you can choose to donate your voice if you are interested. Um, and the the sort of the general idea here is if you donate your voice, um, then it can be used to create synthetic voices for people who have lost the use of their own voice. Um, you can also voice bank your own voice, which again, I think is fine. I don't think it's an issue. Um, however, I do think that generating text using the voice of a living person, right? The voice is PII, it is biometric data, it is identifiable for an individual. I think there's a clear disinformation use here. Um, yep. 
And, you know, I'm a fan of text-to-speech. I don't think that it's bad, but I do think that individuals are harmed when their voices are used for text-to-speech without their explicit consent. Um, in particular, the the lady whose voice was used for the old uh, TikTok text-to-speech did not consent to it um, and had a lot of problems with it. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, Rachel. Uh... Will they give you money? Oh, for the, the donation? So for uh, the vocal ID, uh, you may be able to get paid for it. I believe it's mostly done, you know, as a donation service, right? Like like donating your blood, similarly. Um, you probably can get paid for voice banking. Um, I think it might depend on whether or not someone wanted a voice that was similar for yours for their own purposes. Um, so again, it's, it's usually for, you know, creating prosthetic voices. Anyway. Ugh. I'm just going to reload. I think that'll get rid of it. Yes, fabulous. Okay. Um, so, yes, I'm... I don't think generative text-to-speech is an issue. I think that that is, in fact, probably a good thing. Um, it sounds like the the premise of this company is that you can use it to create novel voices that you know fit the persona that you're looking for, which I think is great. Uh, I think having a demo where you are creating... Uh, new text with uh, not novel voices, like actual people's voices without their consent or knowledge, even if they're celebrities, is uh, not great. But uh, the next one, I <laughs> when I put this in my notes for the week, I had like a sort of like uh, uh, snarky note for on it, like um, NLP practitioners discover language change in progress. Um, which I think is a little bit unfair. Uh, but basically, uh, this is a uh, set of data sets that have, sorry, it's a set of language models trained on new common crawl snapshots. So common crawl is the big web crawl that is used to train a lot of language models. Um, and the, the sort of the interesting research question here is what changes month to month on these corpora collected from internet data? Which is a great question because especially for a lot of the really big large language models, they are not being retrained every month that we know of. Um, you sort of like, they are trained at a static point in time. So one of the big problems, I think it's BERT, is that it doesn't have tokens for years above 2021, uh, or was it 2022? I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, BERT can't tokenize, as it was originally released, uh, years beyond, you know, so far into the future. Um, so the, there are definitely reflexes and, uh, you know, the fact that language data samples are taken at specific points in time is reflected in the models themselves. Uh, and this is a little um, research project, a uh, little research project, I don't know how big the research project is, but this is a research project looking at the effects of those terms. Um, and the, the big ones are that Surprise, surprise, new lexical items pop up and increase in uh, popularity. Um, so here are some of the lexical items that increased in popularity. Uh, Monkeypox outbreak, uh, Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, um, which was passed in July? I don't remember. Um, it's uh, the largest environmental legislation that has ever been passed in the United States history, uh, and potentially, I think, currently the world. So um, yeah, sometimes good stuff happens. Uh, and things like quiet quitting uh, was not seen at all in June, July, and was seen in August. Um, so new lexical items enter the vocabulary. Again, yes, nice to have um, a new thing to point to for this well-known and studied uh, linguistic um, phenomena. Um, you also see things going out of uh, the vocabulary. So uh, Wordle, for example, uh, dropped off uh, between May and June. The Olympic Winter Games dropped off. Um, storm Eunice, which I think was a specific storm, dropped off the French presidential election. So this is uh, the new lexical items include, you know, topics that are coming into the corpus and then uh, topics that are going out of the corpus as well. Um, Fresh websites, lots of new URLs. There's approximately a 1% URL overlap, even for adjacent snapshots. Um, this is good if you want to combine OLM datasets to train a static language model, but bad if you want a data set of website diffs. Uh, and there are lots of duplicates, which is not a surprise, uh, particularly given the number of 
I haven't seen them as much recently, but there used to be like a, a whole big thing with people like republishing Wikipedia articles on their own websites and then doing like SEO optimization to do ad serving. Um, I don't know if y'all seen that, uh, but definitely was a thing. Uh, and there is lots of repetition. So about 23% of the examples were exact duplicates. Um, yeah, so that's the general, uh, the general state of the project so far. They're continuing to work on it. Um, it's nice to see, again, more examples of known phenomena, uh, which is cool. Uh, Tom says, perhaps we should train large language models on science fiction. Uh, I think the, you know, the big issue. So I personally am not a huge fan of using Common Call as a data source for a number of reasons, uh, but a big one is copyright issues. Um, and I would say if it was science fiction that it had been published with, you know, um, a CC0 license or something similar, yes, absolutely. But particularly like published fiction, um, people, people get, that's their job, right? Uh, that's their job and they deserve to be paid for their work. Um, so, yep. Uh, is this the ethics section? No, we're still in practical. We have not gotten to ethics yet. Uh, also practical. Eh, is that going to go away? There we go. Uh, go shoot, shoot. Um, there's uh, this uh, article. Uh, so this is from the Cypress Mail, um, C Y P R U S, and then M A I L, uh, and it's an article on incorporating Cypriot Greek into the AI world by Melissa Heckers from October sixteenth, um, and it's just a cool little uh, talk about research that's been going on to, um, you know, um, collect and organize data for for training models using Cypriot Greek, uh, the variety of Greek that is spoken on Cyprus. Um, so I, you know. Just seems cool seems like it's really needed by and sort of driven by the community itself which is uh again if you watch my channel a lot you know that's something i love i love to see it when people get autonomy and groups get autonomy uh in their language representation so cool project uh next up uh I may skip a couple things, not because they're not interesting, but because I've been doing this for a while and we spent a really long time on, uh, I'll just go over them real quick. Uh, so first of all, uh, Alex Hanna uh, left Google and is now at DARE, uh, the tribute to AI Research Institute. Shoo. Um, so Alex is great. They do fabulous work. Um, if you're not familiar with their research, I'd recommend following them. I think they're briefly at Berkeley for a little bit. Uh, anyway. Uh, and then next up, uh, this is a, it's an interesting piece. So, uh, Alberto is a writer and also, uh, works with AI. So, um, has, uh, input both from the, uh, you know, practitioner side and also the, the writer doer side. Um, and I thought it was just a really interesting discussion about, you know, AI writing and why it's interesting and why it's maybe not actually all that interesting um and what it can replace and what it can't replace so um overall interesting piece i'd recommend reading it i'm not going to sit here and read it but you can if you want to all right politics so uh we have a couple different things here so first of all we have this, which I guess could also have gone in the ethics section. Um, so this is a motherboard article by Chloe Xiang, X I A N, uh, who uh, published it on October 13th. Uh, the article is This Danish political party is led by an AI. It isn't. Uh, the synthetic party in Denmark is dedicated to following a platform churned out by an AI, and its public face is a chatbot leader, a uh, chatbot named Leader Lars. Um, so this is a ridiculous stunt, um, and I hate it. <laughs> That's it. it. It really reminds me of, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the stuff with uh, Sophie the robot, um, where, you know, it's a humanoid robot that says a bunch of program stuff like, I want a child, or, you know, I think, you know, whatever the creators want to, to put in her mouth. Um, but, yep. Uh, 
And uh, I think some interesting things, it's founded by an artist collective uh, and the nonprofit art and tech organization Mind Future Foundation. Um, so yes, uh, definitely a thing that people are doing. I think it's an interesting art project. I. Uh, I'm not thrilled about art projects directly trying to influence elections, but that happened. So, politics. Next up, oh, so this we talked about a little bit earlier uh, about why, you know, just relying on laws and a legal framework for ethical behavior is not always super helpful. Uh, so Turkey, uh, this is from the Financial Times. Uh, it was published on October 13th, and it is by Laura Patel, P-I-T-E-L. Uh, uh, Tom Wright said, the Pirate Party in the UK experimented with democratized policy, and there was one guy trying to do GIT policy, G-I-T. Oh. Uh, I wonder if that is uh, also a little bit of a joke because i believe that uh in the uk git is also like a an insult it's it's nothing in the us it just means like you know github ah uh, political stunts um but yes so for those of you who are not super familiar with turkey um uh, Tayyip Erdogan, the president, uh, is definitely an authoritarian figure, and uh, there's been a lot of, um, you know, authoritarianism happening in the country. Um, like, in particular, I know that uh, people working at universities and professors were targeted by the regime. Um, continues to happen. Uh, and they passed a disinformation bill ahead of elections, and, um, you know, it, it sounds like the, the proposals there are really um, to curtail the freedom of speech and make it more difficult for people to say negative things about the government online, which is not, again, as someone who, you know, uh, believes in free speech as a, as a public good, uh, not delighted by it. Uh, the bill, which was approved by Turkish Parliament late on Thursday, has drawn criticism from across Turkish society, including media groups, economists, and scientists. Uh, the central provision is a proposal that people who disseminate false information about the internal and external security, public order, and general well-being of the country in order to create anxiety, fear, or panic among the public will create a prison sentence uh, by, of between one to three years. The sentence can be increased by half for owners of anonymous social media accounts. Um, critics warn that in a country where Erdogan has already drastically curtailed freedom of speech, the later latest provisions will further restrict the space for criticism of him. So, yes, not great. Uh, and also something that I think, you know, relating this to, to us as technologists, uh, definitely an area where, you know, automated content moderation has the potential to directly support authoritarianism and curtail the free freedom of speech. Uh, Robbie says, do I like generalists or specialists? Uh, it depends. Uh, all right. Uh, next up, so this is an interesting court case. Um, there's, well, I don't think it's a court case, yes, but it's sort of like a question mark. Uh, which do I prefer? That's a good question. Um, I prefer expertise, <laughs> but I don't necessarily uh, require the, you know, I think both are, are useful and interesting. Um, I personally tend to, um, dive very deeply on something for a set period of time and then I get bored and moved on and dive very deeply into something else um, with some exceptions for things that are like clear through lines in my life but yep uh Tom Wright says the UK has its own online harm slash safety bill to prevent misinformation uh the fact checker full fact was pushing for democratic harms Yikes. Uh, and I will say, uh, again, for those of you not familiar, the UK does not have a guarantee to uh, freedom of speech, um, which is a US thing. Um, not exclusively, but it is something that the US um, guarantees that the UK does not, which is why libel cases are much more common in the UK than they are in the US. Um, yeah. Not great. <laughs> not great. Uh, 
anyway, for those of you who are not familiar, Pegasus is spy software that was, um, I believe it's built by an Israeli company and was originally tested on like Palestinians. We talked last week about um, the, you know, automatic, not just like automatic, like automatic fire, but like automatic shooting um, guns that were deployed in uh, a checkpoint in, in Palestine, um, which also hate that uh, very, very much. Um, but sort of a, a general pattern is that, you know, Israeli tech defense tech firms will sort of test stuff on Palestinians and then then sell it elsewhere because like, oh, we've tested it. Uh, Pegasus is one of those things. It is spyware. Um, and there's sort of an ongoing discussion uh, in Mexico about whether or not it was legal uh, in, in the Mexican legal framework. So uh, the Mexican Attorney General's office said on Sunday it is investigating the purchase of Pegasus computer spyware by the previous administration and whether it was carried out legally. Uh, Pegasus belongs to Israeli spyware form NSO group, which typically only sells the software to governments or law enforcement organizations. Um, the prior attorney's general office paid $23 million. Uh, they were trying to establish if it had been done with the proper justification and had followed requisite public tender policies. So um, a lot of money uh, to spend. I'm, I'm obviously like governments um, work at a different scale than other organizations, but yikes. So keep an eye on this space if you are uh, interested in, in spyware. Um, Yes. And finally, we have this, uh, you know, the ADPPA is the uh, American Data Privacy Protection Act, I think. So we don't really have a lot of privacy protections legally in the United States. And this is a Consumer Protection Act that is um, in Congress now. Will it get passed? Question mark. Um, I'm in general in favor of the bill as it currently stands, um, but again, question mark about whether or not it actually gets passed. Uh, but this is a piece from the Center for Democracy and Technology, which we talk about a fair amount on the channel, um, arguing that disabled people in particular need additional protections, right? Um, Disabled people are one of the most hyper-surveilled communities within the U.S. Uh, public and private entities alike collect enormous amounts of often deeply personal data about our lives and health for purposes ranging as benign, such as tracking disability-targeted hiring benchmarks, to malicious, such as profiling students as likely future criminals. Algorithm-driven systems are now commonly power recruiting and hiring processes, tenant background checks, public benefits applications, and even remote test proctoring, all with outsized impact on people with disabilities. Meanwhile, researchers and developers are racing to create increasingly sophisticated algorithms to detect disability and predict future diagnoses of mental health disabilities. Um, Right, so it's a, a piece about like the, the big issues <laughs> uh, that the disabled community are facing um, currently uh, around privacy, around automated systems that are ableist, that just don't work for them, that negatively impact them. Um, I say them, us. <laughs> um, and there's a, uh, you know, argument for including particular protections for disabled people in the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. Um, so, yes. Well, fingers crossed. Would love to see that bill passed. Uh, we'll see if it is or not. I think it's probably going to depend on how the midterm elections uh, shake out in the U.S. Uh, and it's, again, I know very U.S.-centric, but most tech companies are based in the U.S., so laws that we pass have the likely you know, potential to uh, impact folks other, way, other places. And hopefully one of the impacts would be if people in the U.S. get stronger privacy protections, they're just like, well, we're just going to implement the stronger privacy protections for everyone because it's simpler. Fingers crossed. All right, now we're in the ethics section. Uh, so first up, uh, this is a uh, piece from Noema Mag, N-O-E with like a flat accent, M-A. Uh, and it is by Adrian Williams and Milagros Maselli and Timnit McGebro, so three people, uh, that came out October 13th. 
Uh, and the title is The Exploited Labor Behind Artificial Intelligence. Supporting transnational worker organizations should be at the center of the fight for ethical AI, uh, which I definitely agree with. We've talked you know, a couple times on this channel about how a lot of automation is actually secretly outsourcing. Uh, and because a lot of automation is purchased, um, based on cost, the, that outsourced labor is not usually very well compensated um, and continues, you know, the sort of historical pattern of the, you know, value generated by labor of people in the global south being exported as wealth for people in the global north, right? Like direct line so back through the colonialist histories that we all live in the shadow of. Um, yeah, so um, just a, a piece that goes into that in a lot more detail. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, I thought this particular section was really, ooh. Uh, so reading here, tech companies that have branded themselves AI first depend heavily depend on heavily surveilled gig workers like data labelers, delivery drivers, and content moderators. Startups are even hiring people to impersonate AI systems like chatbots due to the pressure by venture capitalists to incorporate so-called AI into their products. In fact, London-based venture capital firm MMC Ventures surveyed 2,830 AI startups in the EU and found that 40% of them didn't use AI in a meaningful way, um, which is quite the percentage. So about half of startups in the EU that say they're using AI are actually just using people to do the labor and putting a robot face on front of it, in the front, on top of it, hiding it, <laughs> hiding it by claiming that it is automation. Um, yep. Exploited workers are often recruited out of impoverished populations and paid as little as $1.46, $1.46 an hour after tax, um, which is, uh, you know, not a lot of money. Uh, and even in places where, um, you know, labor costs, which means that, uh, you know, compensation for, for the work done is very low, that's still... That's not a lot, especially given that uh, many of these companies are making uh, a lot of money. So, you know, just off the top of my head, Stable Diffusion just had a big funding round and is now valued at $1 billion, uh, a company built in no small part on the work of artists, which they in no way compensated those artists for. And that value is based, again, in no small part of, of the idea that they can replace that labor, uh, the labor that the artists are doing with their own technical stuff, and it'll be cheaper for the people who want the art. Um, and if you are doing the art, well, screw you, I guess. I have limited, <laughs> limited patience for that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, Tom says, in fairness, there's sort of a continuum between marketplace and AI. Um, yeah, and I don't think that it's necessarily wrong to hire people to do work. I think that it is wrong to not compensate them. And I think that it is wrong to mislead people about um, who is doing the work. Yeah. Uh, Afla says, I'm curious, what do I think about people claiming companies like Stability AI and OpenAI are stealing data for training and are criminal? I feel this argument is wrong, but I can't say exactly say why. Um, well, I mean, I think it's very much an open question, right? So I don't know if you're here, but there's, which one? This one. Um, there's an open sort of like start of a court case against GitHub Copilot for um, misusing code. Uh, and I would say that I think that Stability AI in particular knows uh, damn well that they don't have the copyright to the images because when they are training their mu music model, um, they publicly said, hey, we're only going to use things that we have the rights for or things that are in the public domain. Um, they did not extend that courtesy to visual artists. Uh, and they are clearly, I mean, it's a legal gray area, right? Like we haven't settled on it yet. Um, I think that it is a shitty thing for them to have done regardless. Um, and it is clear that artists don't like it being done. And it is also being clear that it is used to, that it is being used to replicate the work of artists uh, in a way that, you know, meaningfully impacts them, even if it is only to make them feel bad. Uh, so, yeah. Anyway. Um, uh, Cognition says, this is so uh, pervasive uh, or perverse. What is the opposite of a Turing test? Uh, oh, so proving that you are, you think you're talking to a computer, but you're actually talking to a human. 
I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think it's a deceptive business practice and people should not be doing it. Uh, and, you know, my... I feel pretty strongly that when the dust settles on this, the people who created the training data and hold the copyright for the training data are probably going to get some sort of recompense from the companies that used it without permission. I don't know what that's going to look like. That's just my, my Nostradamus hat. Um, the other thing that might happen is uh, what's known as the algorithmic death penalty, which is being used uh, more and more often um, or being handed down by judges, which is that if you trained a model using data you shouldn't have gotten, you have to delete the model and everything that relies on the model. Um, so if that happens, then anyone who is, you know, relying on these things is going to have a, a bad time. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Alpha says, right, that makes sense. Looking forward to how this paves the way for further regulation and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, you know, as, oh, I'll click to the next thing. Um, as technologists, I think that most of us want to be careful and do a good job and build something that will last and that doesn't hurt people. Um, and, you know, it's a very fast moving landscape, but I certainly wouldn't <laughs> be using any of st uh, stability uh, or, um, open AI's, um, you know, stuff in mission critical products myself, just personally. Uh, Nine Gaming says, didn't DMCA go after these companies? Um, you will notice again that the uh, music, <laughs> when Stability AI trained their music model, they chose to not use uh, anything that the rights were held by a record company. Um, so I think they're aware of it. No. <laughs> Tom says, beep, beep, boop, I'm a robot. Yeah. Uh, Cognition says it's an insane version of the trope of AI pretending to be human based on the glamour around the value of AI systems. Yeah. Um, yep. Anyway, um, also on the uh, ethics side, so this is from uh, the... Where was this first published? Here we go. Uh, at N Wave. So, N Wave is new ways of analyzing variation. Uh, and it is a the big conference for sociolinguistics. Uh, yeah, let me go a little bit bigger. Uh, the big conference for sociolinguistics that happened this week. Um, it's one of the conferences that when I was actively doing research, I went to every year. So, feeling a little bit like um, you know, a little FOMO, but uh, I'm not traveling for conferences or really doing anything in person these days. So, uh, and it is by Rickard Dockham, uh, visiting assistant professor at Swarthmore, and Caitlin Green, uh, independent scholar, which is also what I would say I am right at the moment. Um, and uh, it's a sort of a, you know, discussion of some of the problems in linguistics as a field. Uh, and in particular, you know, this is part of a panel, decolonization and inclusion in linguistics, uh, setting the framework for liberatory linguistics. And if you're not super familiar with the field, um, linguistics has a history in a very, um, you know, colonial archeology span um, and, uh, also today, a lot of linguistics work that's being done is funded uh, by Christian missionary organizations. So again, very much part of that colonial history. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, some problems with the field. Field could be better. Um, and uh, they sort of talk about the history of gatekeeping, uh, divisiveness, and false dichotomies, right? So formal versus functional, theoretical versus fide, uh, P side versus S side, academic versus industry. If you if you are in linguistics or sort of interested in the field, uh, there's a book called The Linguistic Wars that talks about sort of the uh, um, Uh, I guess it would be sort of intra-side <laughs> discussion, but sort of the the rise of generative linguistics in the uh, uh, in the U.S. as opposed to sort of the the previous um, more uh, Pragian school of stuff. Um, aggressive and adversarial interactions uh, with colleagues. So very famously, <laughs> uh, there was uh, a talk at. UCLA maybe um, on on phonology where at the end of the talk uh, somebody stood up and threw a chair 
<laughs> at the speaker. Um, I don't remember all of the, the details precisely, but that was at one point in linguistics, not uncommon in the field. Um, yep. Uh, anyway, so the, the there's a problem, right? So exclusionary socialization, people who want to get involved with the field don't know how to do it, they have a hard time, uh, epistemic injustice, and then ignoring power imbalances, um, right? So um, linguistics is often treated like a series of forward leaps by geniuses, uh, va value prestige drawn from proximity to genius, and then emphasis on academic pedigree. So. Um, Obviously, uh, Noam Chomsky is a well-known linguist um, who was one of the people who helped develop, um, you know, a lot of the ideas behind, you know, generative syntax, but certainly not the only one. Uh, scholarship is never done in a vacuum. Uh, the notion of core subfields is still used today, emerging from this area, right? So like uh, phonology is a core subfield, uh, syntax is a core subfield, sociolinguistics is not, despite the fact that all language use is social. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, the history of the field has some issues. Uh, so, uh, particularly early in the history of the field and when, uh, NLP and linguistics was much more closely related, we've talked about this on the channel. A lot of the funding came from the U S government specifically for defense purposes. Um, so a lot of the sort of early work in NLP was done by DARPA, um, the Bake Offs, the DARPA Bake Offs, you may have heard of those were really foundational and sort of the original setting up of the field. Um, and that was, you know, Defense <laughs> Advanced Research Project Agency um, directly related to the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense. So uh, big uh, history of problems there. Uh, and also sort of this idea of, again, an extractive relationship with people from, you know, wealthy Western countries coming into other, you know, marginalized communities and being like, I'm going to take the information about your language and I'm going to put it in a book and then I will be the one who knows about your language. Um, uh, a history of vulnerable communities having negative encounters with linguists is a good way to put it. And right behind me, uh, eh, you can see uh, Lakota elders helped a white man preserve their language, then he tried to sell it back to them. So again, this is not always, it can be, uh, but it's not always a situation of, you know, mutual beneficial relationships between linguists and the communities that they work with. <laughs> uh, Tom says, all language use is social, spitting facts, absolutely. Uh, how much uh, machine learning for sociolinguistics is there? That's a great question. So let me, uh, the sort of general uh, subfield that works with that is computational sociolinguistics. Uh, and I actually have a blog post on it, but I believe it's a little bit older now. Uh, when did Dong's uh, survey come out? 2016. Okay, so those would be uh, uh, kind of contemporaneous. Um, it's a pretty good uh, uh, good reference, though. Um, but the answer is some, uh, and mostly the sort of uh, pattern that happens a little bit more commonly is that um, somebody working in NLP will discover something and be like, "Oh, it's so weird that language does this," and the sociolinguist will be like, "Yes." Here's a paper from 1942 that talks about language doing this. Um, and they may or may not read the paper. Uh, but this is a, if you're interested in learning about it, this is a good survey article uh, by uh, Dong Nguyen uh, A. Seza Dogruas. I have absolutely said that wrong. I apologize. Uh, Carolyn P. Rose and Francesca De Jong uh, in Computational Linguistics, the journal um, from 2016 that sort of goes over the history of the field. Uh, what type of problems would I put in the social science basket? Um, so if you are talking about groups of people and their, you know, behavior and beliefs, I would say generally that's going to be in the social science basket. It's a big basket, right? Because uh, a lot of stuff, it turns out, is social because, again, we are a social species. Oh, bye, Cognition. Uh, yes, Congregation <laughs> says the music industry is famously litigious. Yes, it is. Uh, and also there's a small number of rights holders that are very powerful and, uh, you know, again, litigious. So uh, unlike in the visual arts field where there are a large number of rights powers of rights holders that generally don't have the money to lawyer up every time they, you know, have their, their rights uh, 
infringed upon. Uh, the clear counterexample to that being Thomas Kincaid or like Anish Kapoor or some of these like super duper litigious artists to, um, not the biggest fan of either of those people, I would say, but if you were looking for an example of artists that do have the power and uh, money to, you know, uh, go to court whenever they think they've been slighted, those are, those are two examples. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I hope you really enjoy it. Dong is uh, absolutely fabulous. I have, not in this bookshelf, uh, I have her dissertation. Uh, she sent me a printed copy of her dissertation when she finished it, uh, which was just a delight. She is a, a great researcher. I think she's at the Turing Institute still at the moment. So, uh, really lovely person, really great researcher. I'd highly recommend uh, re reading everything she's ever written, to be perfectly honest. Uh, yes. Uh, and then we have, uh, you know, linguistics is not representative of the population as a whole. It tends to be young, white, very narrowly focused, very uh, paternalistic, uh, deeply rooted in unexamined colonialism and racism. And I think this has gotten a little bit better over time, but not amazing. Uh, and of course, we have the sort of pattern that we do with all professorships, which is that most professors come from a small number of degree granting institutions. So uh, in linguistics, you can see the vast majority come from MIT, uh, and then uh, foreign universities, that's all of them, uh, UMass Amherst, UC Berkeley, UCLA, UPenn, Stanford, uh, Toronto, Harvard, UCSC, and then they sort of get down below 20 total people. Um, so 25% of all faculty in US and Canadian PhD granting linguistics programs graduated from three departments, 50% from just 10 departments. Um, so my advisor went to UCLA, right? So he is definitely in uh, this, this top five here. Uh, yes, and then just sort of like, general issues with the field and what's considered good and valuable work and what isn't. Um, big power imbalances. Um, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on in the, in the field. Um, and there are some some fake tweets here, fictionalized tweets based on real ones to avoid uh, drawing unwanted attention where senior scholars went on, on Twitter and like basically yelled at very junior scholars who are not in a position of power. Um, I try to be particularly mindful about calling out junior scholars on stuff uh, on my Twitter, usually if something comes up um, and I think there's an issue, I will try to contact them directly um, rather than talking about it. Um, unless they already have more visibility than I would be able to give them by, by talking about it. So this is definitely something I'm very aware of, even though I'm not, you know, really a scholar, I'm definitely somebody that is known in the field. Um, yep. Uh, linguistics has, it's got its problems like all field. Uh, yes. So kind of, uh, kind of a lots of issues and then a discussion about like what can be done to make it better. Um, Lots of things, uh, and I think these are just also good for everybody can to consider, and I think a lot of these things also apply to technology and computational linguistics. Uh, we call on everyone to evaluate your power and influence, definitely something that, that I do, right? Uh, power hierarchies can make you feel powerless, but you are not, right? So I said, you know, I am not an active scholar in the field, um, but I'm known, right? Like, I have close connections with lots of senior scholars, um, you know, uh, people tend to know who I am in my sub sub field because <laughs> uh, I'm a very public person. So if I'm like, this person is the worst person ever and you should never hire them and here's why, um, I think that that might potentially sway somebody if they were considering their, their application in the first round of applications, right? Um, so even though I don't have institutional power, I do have soft power and that's something that I consider when I talk about things online. Uh, every person has the ability to reinforce or challenge norms, uh, and we can achieve ambient belonging for all backgrounds and career stages, which would be great. Um, it'd be great to see, because everybody uses language, right? Linguistics is an important field that has the capacity to really improve people's lives. I believe that, still do, um, especially in the, in the realm of language technology. Um, and I mean, honestly, linguistics is, even with the problems of the field, done a better job of being accepting than uh, machine learning in particular. Um, but yeah. Uh, anyway, and then there's a bunch of the ideas for what different people can do uh, in, in different uh, situations. Uh, and I think the section that's, uh, you know, 
most relevant here would be the linguistics beyond acad linguists beyond academia uh, for probably for most of you all, I'm guessing, because uh, I think mostly you're technologists. Uh, <laughs> Tom Wright says, regarding blacklisting, well, might need to start using a pseudonym. Yeah, but like you, sh you shouldn't have to, right? Like, as long as you are working within the bounds of civil society, I don't think you should have to separate your life in that way unless you have a compelling reason to do so and you actively want to do so, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, so those of you who are interested, I'll pop the link to this in uh, chat. Uh, if you want to find out more, or I think you can just scan it. Uh, but yes, interesting discussion. Uh, definitely some things that I think about quite a lot. Uh, and it was nice to see uh, covered in wave. All right, next up. Uh, <laughs> so for those of you who are listening, I'm sorry for screaming. Um, this is a piece by The Intercept, published October 17th by Sam Biddle, B-I-D-D-L-E. Uh, I'm just going to read the headline and move on. Oakland cops hope to arm robots with lethal shotguns. While official language condoning killer robots is shelved for now, Oakland police are still pursuing the option. Um, and like we talked about last week, automated guns on Palestinian checkpoints, um, and they want to bring it to the U.S., except they also want them to be mobile and to, uh, you know, k kill people. So that's cool. Cool, 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 cool. It's not cool. I hate it. I hate it so much. Um, FYI, if you are in Oakland, maybe contact your representatives and tell them, no, no, please, no, please, God, no. Maybe do that. All right. Also on the ethics section, I'm sorry, reloading real quick. Um, so this is from uh, MIT Technology Review. Uh, it is by Charlotte G. J. E. E. Uh, published October 18th. Uh, and it's a piece about uh, technology lets us speak to our dead relatives has arrived, are we ready? So I believe this is the one where the author, yes, um, the author trained uh, a chatbot based on the speech of her parents. Um, both of her parents are currently living, I would say. Um, I don't, I, that makes it sound like me saying them is what makes them currently living. Uh, I'm just communicating that to you. I'm pretty sure that's what it said in the article. Um, and yeah, we talked about this earlier today. Um, I think that if you are doing this with the explicit consent of the person uh, that you are, whose voice you are using, I think that it can be okay. Um, I strongly believe that particularly the dead, we should not be using their voices without their consent, right? Just like any other donorship model, you can't get somebody's liver if they are not an organ donor, right? They have to consent to the donation of the use of their, um, their body, uh, their you know physical identity. Your your voice is directly tied to your physical identity. Um, I would say that this would also include things like um, look-alike avatars trained on signing data. I don't know that anyone's doing that, um, but yes, that's that's my stance on that. I think we've talked about it quite a bit, um, but just to just to show that it is not a hypothetical right people are currently doing this and people are charging you to do this which is also a thing um yeah also the way that this uh, this discussion goes is um the way that this discussion is described is very unsettling right uh they told me personal stories i'd never heard so this is again just based on a, a chat bot i learned about the first and certainly not last time my dad got drunk mom talked about getting in trouble for staying out late they gave me life advice and told me things about their childhood as well as my own it was mesmerizing ah for those of you who are listening i'm making a big face <laughs> Uh, Tom Wright says, uh, there's a Black Mirror where this is the plot. Oh, good to know. I've not actually watched any Black Mirror, um, but yep. Yep. Uh, so the company that did this was called Hereafter AI, uh, powered by more than four hours of conversations they each had with an interviewer about their life and memories. Uh, yep. Yeah, and her parents are still alive. Or sorry, this author's parents are still alive. Next up, uh, again. Um, so again, on the ethics section, oh, this one. <laughs> uh, so this is a tweet from uh, Serge, Sergey, probably Sergey, Eagleman, Eagleman. 
a gentleman uh, at V zero max uh, on Twitter, uh, director of usable security and privacy at IC slap Berkeley uh, CTO at consensus Inc. Um, and a discussion of um, a discussion uh, that he had with an IRB. Uh, so I'm just going to read it and then we'll talk about it a little bit. <laughs> oh, okay. So the, the episode is entitled, uh, be right back. Uh, Tom says, uh, good if you want to feel upset for a few days. I'll tell you what, I do not need fiction to be upset about technology. <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Um, so as a researcher, it is not my responsibility to hide corporate malfeasance. I was just told it's unethical to study privacy compliance practices because exposing non-compliance can create at legal problems for those companies. Uh, corporations are not people. It's not my job to cover for them. Out of curiosity, for people who believe that studying privacy issues in consumer products requires informed consent of manufacturers, do you believe the same for security vulnerabilities? Should every attack paper get informed consent from vendors? That's obviously ridiculous. So I think this idea idea that um you know you need to consider potential harms to companies when you're doing research which a i strongly disagree with um i i don't think that's the case uh comes from this idea of corporate personhood and the idea of corporations as moral agents um which uh a really good paper we read in my uh ethics class that i'm teaching this quarter about this so let me just pull up that paper real quick uh if any of you are interested in reading it it's really good i'd highly recommend it um do, 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 do. And here we go the paper is uh corporate moral agency and the responsibility to respect human rights and the un guiding principles and i will say this is part of like an ongoing uh discussion and conversation but i thought that this was a particularly good article so i'll just pop this uh about um can i oh well the link is too long the link is too long Never mind. I guess you're just going to have to search the article title. Um, the article that I was talking about is by Patricia H. Werhane, W-E-R-H-A-N-E, -E, and the article is Corporate Moral Agency and the Responsibility to Respect Human Rights and the UN Guiding Principles, Do Corporations Have Moral Rights, uh, published uh, by Cambridge University Press in Human Business and Human Rights Journal, November 13th, 2015. Um, and Patricia in the paper argues that no, um, corporations have a responsibility not to harm people um, as determined by society, uh, but they themselves do not get rights. Um, and I think that if you do argue that corporations deserve rights, then in a research ethics frame for, standpoint, it makes sense that like, hey, you don't want to hurt people when you're doing research. Uh, and if you consider corporations people, then any research that hurts corporations would be unethical in that framing, um, which I think is bonkers. <laughs> uh, I strongly disagree with the idea that you need to get, um, you know, consent from corporations before you do uh, research on their uh, privacy compliance practices, for example. So, yeah. Uh, I think it is important to uh, consider ethical frameworks as they intersect with each other and also, you know. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, oh, so this one, hmm. I guess this could also have gone in politics, uh, but this is from Rest of the World, uh, one of our favorite news sources on this channel. Huge fan of Rest of the World. Uh, it's about the rest of the world outside of the US, US and EU, as it turns out, that's where most people live. Uh, and this article is by Viola Zhao, C-H-O-U, uh, came out October 13th, 2022. Uh, and the title is Chinese live, live streamers say Douyin, do Douyin, I don't know what the tones are supposed to be, apologies, uh, is cutting off non-Mandarin speakers. Um, so basically this uh, live streaming app, if you are not speaking Mandarin, so China is a country that has a lot of languages, a lot of language varieties, um, Cantonese is probably one of the better known ones that's spoken in Hong Kong uh, and that sort of Southern China region. Uh, but there's a bunch of other language varieties uh, spoken there as well. Um, 
languages and language varieties spoken in China as well. Uh, and apparently if you are not speaking Mandarin, which is the state language, um, you can just be cut off. So this is a clear example of linguistic discrimination, um, which is discrimination against a language or language variety, and is almost always a proxy against for discrimination against the people who speak that language or language variety, right? So linguistic discrimination against African American English is going to discriminate against African Americans. Linguistic discrimination against, you know, um, you know, Arabic as a language is going to discriminate against people who speak Arabic, right? So, um, yeah. Bad. Don't like it. Um, not great. Moving on. I don't have much to say about it besides that I don't like it. And it's, you know, again, discrimination against people who don't use uh, that, that language uh, and not just the language itself. Uh, so this is an article uh, for The Atlantic called The Rise of Luxury Surveillance. And I'm just gonna pop this in the chat as well. Um, so we've talked about this before. Uh, even today, sort of like products that are surveilling you, uh, that you pay for. Uh, and it is by uh, Chris Gilliard, 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 G-I-L-L-I-A-R-D, who I believe is hyper visible on Twitter, uh, if you know that account. Uh, and it came out October 18th. Uh, and uh, yeah, it talks about all of the ways that tech companies are um, specifically Amazon here, um, getting you to pay them to collect your data to use for their own purposes. Um, so I think the, you know, we often think about surveillance as something that is done to marginalized people, people not in a position of power, right? So um, students, workers, um, prisoners, children, uh, people who are from marginalized communities. Uh, we've talked about the example of folks in Palestine a lot today. Um, without their consent on the behalf of people who have power, um, but also it's something that people are willingly doing to themselves for the promise of ease or convenience or cachet. Um, and a discussion of that, so the, the, the idea of luxury surveillance. So I think a great example of luxury surveillance would be like a Fitbit, um, which is collecting and sh sharing your data um, in a very personal way. Um, and maybe that's something that you find value and joy in, and it's something that you like doing and you're willing to make that trade off. And maybe, you know, you don't realize you're making that trade off. Or um, I think another good example here is uh, like genetic testing, right? Um, I think a lot of people find a lot of like joy and interest and intrigue in doing their own genetic testing and being like, oh, you know, uh, I'm 118th Sicilian or something, um, or I have, you know, a, a link to this particular heritage. Um, but in a when that is done on a population scale and at a very large scale, you are also giving up a lot of personal information. Um, and even though we do in the United States have protection against discrimination from the content of uh, you know, your, your genome, um, there are limited protections against it, for example, being used to uh, you know, uh, incriminate you in various situations, right? And you don't even need to have your genetic data uh, you know, sold to one of these companies for it to be used against you because you, know, you share genetic data with your relations. So if enough of your relations have used this service, you can sort of be triangulated on, um, even if it's a mistake, right? So anyway, um, Yep, I didn't used to think that this was a problem, and I now kind of think that it's actually a huge problem. Um, and that's just something that I've come to over time, right? So, yep, interesting article. Uh, I, I think um, well-written, uh, and I'd recommend reading it if you were interested in it. Speaking of surveillance being used against people, uh, so this is about a Virginia company, um, and it was published September 27th, 2022, so it's from a little bit ago, um, and this is from NBCWashington.com. Uh, this piece is by Sean Yancey, Rick Yarborough, Steve Jones, and Jeff Piper, um, and it's... Uh, basically an automated gun having detector, basically, uh, that uses computer vision. Um, and 
Uh, something that I thought was uh, particularly um, interesting about this was this section here, right? So. Asked how the AI can tell the difference between a potential shooter and a police officer who walks in with a weapon, Frazier explains, the technology is not simply just recognizing guns, it actually needs to identify that there's a threat. The gun has to actually be brandished for it to be determined a threat. There's many people who open carry or law enforcement officer security guard. Um, so, not only, this is not a uh, technology that detects guns, it is a computer vision te technology that detects people who look threatening um, and also they think might have a gun. Um, which, if you are uh, familiar with how dangerous to its citizenry the police force in the United States is, is deeply concerning. So not only is this surveillance, but it's surveillance that's, um, you know, directly tied into um, mechanisms for state violence. Uh, and if you're familiar with ShotSpotter, which is a company that claims they can detect uh, gunshots uh, through placing a bunch of microphones in public places, um, that has not been upheld by, by research. Um, in one instance in Chicago, a uh, shot spotter was like, there's a gunshot here. And I think it was a 13 year old child was killed by the police who was unarmed um, because of, uh, you know, or at least it was a contributing factor that this, this automated system made a mistake. Um, and here we have more automated systems, more coverage, more surveillance, uh, more direct links to, you know, uh, between surveillance technology and the police. And again, the United States, you know, uh, in the US, the police are not uh, great. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, Tom says, this problem feels like it generally shows up in medicine. Uh, treatments and testing can be used against you. Uh, yeah, if the, if the data is collected, for sure. So. Anyway, not great. Oh, cool. Uh, during the pilot program, he said the technology did get some self pos false positives with cell phones. Cell phones, those things we all have in our hands 80% of the time. Ah, I hate this. I hate this as a technologist. Like, as a technologist, I know that this doesn't work. As a citizen, I hate the idea of this being used where I am uh, or where people are. Um, uh, yeah, all around. Bad. Do not like it. On that note, let's turn to fun. <laughs> uh, something a little bit less upsetting. Uh, I always like to end on a high note because we always talk about heavy stuff in this, uh, um, this stream. My God, I wish we didn't have to. I wish we didn't have to. I wish AI was like, and, and NLP was still like a fun kooky subfield and we could just talk about like parsers. Well, maybe not parsers. Parsers are not my favorite thing. But like we could just talk about like tokenizers the whole time. And I could be like, look at this fun project I built. But no, we we have to talk about authoritarianism and surveillance because it's happening to people and our field is directly enabling it. And it makes me so frustrated. <laughs> so frustrated. It could be better. It could be better. It could be better. Moving on to fun. Speaking of things that could be better, uh, let me just reload this really quick to get rid of that overlay. Um, so this is a tweet from uh, Matt Blackwell on Twitter. Um, and uh, if you were wondering what the difference between statistical modeling and machine learning is, good news, this infographic has you covered. Uh, so statistical modeling uses finite data sets and reasonable number of observations as opposed as opposed to machine learning, which uses vast amounts of data to learn and perform intelligent actions. Um, so I like the like the both uh, the sort of implication that machine learning uses infinite data and an unreasonable number of observations, uh, and also that uh, statistical modeling does not do any learning. Um, which is just I don't know very funny. Uh, and uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, a lot of people in the um, uh, in the comments are sort of making fun of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the distance, the difference between statistical modeling and machine learning is um, sociological, right? It's disciplinary. Statistical modeling comes from statistics. Machine learning comes from machine learning. Um, they are fields that historically have um, had different people in them doing slightly different work, um, even though they are very similar. 
<laughs> Zach says, intelligent actions. Yes, indeed. Mm. Buddy, I'm tired of your pop-ups. Um, <laughs> uh, and here we have a, a funny error. I love a funny error. Um, so it looks like this is search results. I don't know which... Um, where this is coming from, it looks like it might be from a mobile interface, possibly. So the uh, there's a section that says more results. Uh, this is a tweet by Gaspar Bikas. What does this accent mean? It's like a V-shaped accent. Does it mean sh Gaspar Bigas, perhaps? Um, at B-E-G-U-S-G-A-S-P-E-R, uh, associate professor at UC Berkeley. And the uh, under more results, there is a question, what are the five branches of linguistics? Uh, and the, the result, which is an extractive uh, summary, is what is linguistics? Phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. Um, and what is funny to me about this is, A, that's six things, <laughs> not five things, uh, for those of you who are, who are good at counting. Um, and the other thing is, uh, those that's not all of the branches of linguistics, right? You also have, uh, you know, um, psycholinguistics, sociolinguistics, um, uh, language topology, uh, linguistic anthropology, um, computational modeling, depending on where that goes, computational linguists. So uh, not, a, not a great answer to the question and uh, an error that comes from an NLP system, funnily enough. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Tom says, legacy statistical modeling. Indeed. Uh, Robbie says, what about the mass equations behind statistics, machine learning, and deep learning? I mean, I would say that deep learning did come out of machine learning, which is probably one of the bigger differences. Um, before deep learning was as common, I think there was a lot more uh, overlap between machine learning and statistics. Uh, so, yes. So all around, bad job, <laughs> this search engine uh, and the extractive summary and the, the modeling. Um, at a guess, I think it's probably a Google search, which I know incorporates BERT. And as we know, large language models are very bad at counting, um, which uh, is discussed in that Twitter thread I shared a while ago um, that looks at, um, sort of talks about critical AI studies. Have I ever heard of quantum economics? I have not. Those are two things that I don't know should be together. Uh, shoot. Uh, and now we have a, uh, a tweet from uh, Mark Rydell, uh, M-A-R-K underscore R-I-E-D-L on Twitter, um, who actually works on, uh, on storytelling and story generation, so at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, and uh, he has really good news for us all. Uh, he's figured out how to use reinforcement learning with supervised data sets, and it's using reinforcement labels. And for those of you who are listening, um, this is a picture of a box of those little sort of like donut shaped circular labels that you put over hole punched marks. Uh, so you can put things in binders and move them back and forth without tearing the paper. Uh, and the, the box is labeled reinforcement labels. Ha -cha -cha -cha. It's a dumb pun, but I hope you enjoyed it because it made me smile. Uh, Robbie says no one uses it. Uh, we got one more fun Twitter joke. Uh, actually, this one isn't a joke. This is just a cool uh, art project. Oh, it's going to reload. Uh, this is just a cool generative art project. Um, so this is from... <sighs> Ijeamaka, again, apologize if I say that incorrectly, um, at I-J-E-A-M-A-K-A -A -A underscore A on Twitter, and I'll pop this in the chat as well, um, who's working on a generative art project using R. Uh, and a little you know, visual interpretation or voice interpretation. I forget what it said. I'm just going to describe it. Uh, so you've got a uh, multicolored uh, O's, uh, strings of multicolored O's that are going uh, across the background, uh, but they have, they wiggle in such a way that when you look at the whole image, it looks like uh, sort of a 3D topographic sort of fabric wave sort of thing. Uh, it looks really cool. Uh, and some more information from the author. Uh, I created a generative art system inspired by the appearance of hills slash mountainous regions, but using very simple shapes. It'll become more apparent with 
future outputs I share. Uh, I'd really like to return this for a different project because I like it, but it doesn't work for the end goal I have. So a little uh, work in project using R to do generative artistry. Um, and I think I can really see like this image in particular as like wallpaper at like a fun coffee shop. Um, I don't know. I thought it was cool, so I thought I would highlight it. See, I don't hate generative art. <laughs> it is That is not the issue here. Uh, and finally, um, I am going to talk about food for a second. So uh, this is the last thing on the stream. And if you want to hop out now, feel free. But we're going to talk about food for a second. Uh, and uh, this is a salon piece by Maggie Hennessy, H-E-N-N-E-S-S-Y. -S I think that's the same as the booze. I could be wrong. Uh, published October 18th. Uh, and the title is From Altoona, spelled A T O O N A, to Mountain Pie. Hyper regional pizza styles are a source of deep pride. Um, so I think this is just, it was a really cool article. I, in a different world, I'll post the link to this if y'all want to read it. Uh, in a different world or different life, I probably did uh, my PhD in anthropology of like uh, folk food ways. Um, I am really interested in regional variation in food. It's one of those things that just really makes me interested and excited. Um, and uh, from an NLP's perspective, I think it's really interesting because these are going to be very rare lexical items, um, right? So I imagine if you ran this story through, you know, various tokenizers, you'd probably get a lot of, uh, you know, uh, very rare lexical items in there, perhaps even some out of vocabulary rares. Um, and they just talk about like different types of very regional pizzas, like Indian pizza, uh, a crisp New Yorkish style crust topped with uh, masala, tandoori chicken, uh, dal makhani, or spinach and paneer. Spinach and paneer sounds like an amazing pizza style. Uh, created in the mid 1980s, and you can only get it around San Francisco. Um, and uh, this information comes from the Regional American Foods Twitter account. Uh, which is at regional us food if you are interested uh yeah absolutely uh ravi says i love pizza so i sorry luke says i love pizza so i'll add this to my blog yeah uh i've really been enjoying following this uh this twitter account uh, Robbie says food is a big part of culture. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they actually they talked about something that's hyper regional to here um in i think it's richmond and tidewater and it's uh white sauce white salsa white salsa white sauce one sec I think it's white salsa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, white salsa, um, which is not salsa made by white people, but I see how you could get there. Uh, but it's sort of like a mayonnaise onion based dip, which sounds weird, but I promise it's very good. Um, and if you go to a Mexican place around here and you get like, you know, they come to the table and they give you like chips and salsa, uh, they'll usually give you like chips, you know, like red salsa and then white salsa, which is like, a cream based salsa it's really good but very regional um like you can't even get that in dc right it's just like this little bit anyway uh cool discussion of different types of pizza uh and why people are interested in it and how it's a source of pride and a lot of like unique uh things right so like uh mountain pie which is a colorado style pizza uh which is deep dish with honey sweetened crust that's sold by the pound interesting uh pickle pizza a fixture of the indiana state fair in which dill ranch sauce mozzarella cheese dill seasoning and dill pickles top a homemade crust that sounds amazing that sounds so good i love pickles um I love pickles. I love pickled things. I am a big fan of that flavor profile. That sounds really good. But anyway, so if you are interested in, uh, oh, it's lunchtime. I am hungry. <laughs> it is past lunchtime. Um, yeah, a uh, interesting piece, interesting Twitter account. Um, just cool, just cool stuff. I thought y'all would find that fun. So that is actually all that I have for today. We got through it. Can you believe it? <laughs> it's been a while. I feel like these keep getting longer, even though I'm intentionally trying to do f fewer links. Uh, but, uh, and before we head out, I do want to give a big shout out to uh, everyone who supports me uh, on my coffee. You all make this possible in a very real way. Um, 
I'm still not getting paid, but I am not paying to work, which is very important to me. So I appreciate that. Uh, and a big shout out to uh, David Duma, who is my most recent new monthly member. So thank you, David. Um, yeah. And if you would also like to join my monthly supporters, my coffee is on that side. Uh, it's K-O-F-I-R-C-T-A-T-M-A-N, which I uh, am everywhere. R-C-T-A-T-M-A-N is my just sort of general handle that I get. Uh, so big shout out to my supporters. I appreciate you. I see some of y'all in the chat. Loot docking. Thank you. Uh, good. I'm really glad you're learning a lot. Uh, and I will be back on Tuesday. Oh, thank you, Luke. Uh, I will be back on Tuesday, uh, for something else. I'll figure it out. I don't have it planned out quite yet, but it'll be fun. We'll have a good time. Uh, and then next Thursday, we'll be back for yet more uh, coffee chats uh, with yet more coffee. So looking forward to that. Uh, I'll see you all on Tuesday. Have a great weekend. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Oh, Benson says bark. <laughs> Bye.